What is up, Los Angeles? Mi querido Los Angeles, it is a nice and cold day this Thursday afternoon. It is our 13th episode of LA Taco Live with Laura, and I'm tripping the fuck out because I feel like I blinked and 13 episodes happened. But if it's not your first time watching, again, we thank you for writing hard with us. For all the folks that engage with us through the YouTube comments, the LA Taco team and I just send you all the gratitude for tuning in all these 13 episodes. Um, and if you're new to the game, then we got to let you know that LA Taco is a publication that puts out stories about Los Angeles food, culture, politics, everything known in Los Angeles, LA Taco's on it, okay? And at the show, we make those stories come alive. We bring those folks that we're writing about. We bring comedians. We bring authors. Today's lineup for the show is fire as fuck. We have a Bidia King in the house. We have a best-selling author. And we have Eric Huerta himself, who's going to just break down Boyle Heights and swap me. So it's going to be some good conversations. And I'm super excited to get into it with you all. Um... As always, we're starting with a rant, as you know, as you know. But before we get into that rant, the first one is that I want to recap Birria Mania. Y'all, the first ever Birria Mania happened this past Saturday at the Santa Anita Racetracks. And I just want to say that it was a good ass time. Shout out to Sam Nunez. I was going to say her whole name, Samantha. Samantha girl, Sam. And Memo Torres, who really put in all the work to make this event come to life. There were six Birria vendors. And your girl, me, was invited to be a Birria judge you know a taste judge um along with folks like mala muñoz josh schrer nicole Enayari, and jesus nalgas it was such a good time judging the birria with these folks and listen i'm a birria fan i love birria but i grew up with it the res i should say i grew up with both um we'll talk more about birria more in the episode but essentially first time i tried goat birria it tasted like i was biting the goat's hair the head you know like the dirty goat it tasted like i was i'm that passionate about it like i was biting the dirty goat so i never um went to goat birria again but i just gotta say that goat mafia changed my mind goat mafia's goat birria was so good my mouth is watering. They provided like um, the birria en el hueso, con el hueso pa chupar. And like they, they dressed it really nicely with some aesthetically beautifully placed flowers, um, some cebollas curtidas. It was such a good taco. Uh, the people's choice, the people's champion was Teddy's Red Tacos, which we're actually having Teddy on the show today. And then the judge's choice was Tacos y Birria La Unica. So there were some heavy hitters, y'all. I can't say there wasn't a taco I did not enjoy. Every single one that I tried was amazing. Um, and I, I think Memo made a joke about us being over birria for the rest of the year, and that's never possible. Because if it's something you can dip, if it's something that's juicy and meaty, I'm on it a thousand percent. Never will get tired of it. Uh, so yeah, shout out again. Stay tuned for all the Ali Taco fans. Birria Mania is coming back, backed, back in full effect next year. It was such a great first year, and I just know we're gonna do it bigger and better next year. So thanks to everybody who came, and stay tuned for the next one. The next rant. My favorite, y'all, I don't know if we're beating a dead horse, and I hate that saying because it's a little bit violent, but we're going to get into it. We're going to do it. We're going to have to get into Will Smith. We're doing it. I feel like I could feel the groans from folks watching at home or from wherever you're tuning in from. But Will Smith slapped Chris Rock at the Oscars. I don't watch the Oscars every year, but this year it was a Sunday, and I told myself I was going to sit my ass at home where I pay rent. Um, and I watched from start to finish. And when the moment happened, I thought there was a glitch in my, in, on my TV. I was like, oh, fuck. The internet went out, right? I was streaming through ABC7. Um, and I was shook, okay? There's so much to say. There's so much to comment on. I, we know I'm not the first one commenting. It's been a couple of days or several days since. But I want to start off by, you know, critiquing and um, calling out my favorite person, white men. Okay, let's start off with white men. I just want, if folks weren't where people to know that Judd Apatow was popping the fuck off okay Judd Apatow um I know him more as Leslie Mann's husband um really um but essentially he made an anti-black exaggerative comment saying that Will Smith's slap could have killed Chris Rock I need to pause for my eye roll and it's gonna be two eyes not even just one the fucking exaggeration Judd Siéntate, bebe. Siéntate porque estás exagerando que hasta me quiero desmayar. It was not that dramatic. And I just want to point that this connects so much to the ways in which we have perspectives on black people being violent. Okay? 
Chris Rock made a joke about G.I. Jane. We know that Jada Pinkett suffers from alopecia. Will Smith got up and slapped him. Gave him a nice little pow, right? It wasn't a sock. I had I didn't see the slap when it was the glitch. So I, I want to just point out that I was super upset that Judd Apatow tweeted that and then got scaredy and deleted it. The next white man that I want to uh, critique is Jim Carrey. If you follow me on Instagram at Hungry Nisos, you saw that I reposted this. Jim Carrey said that he was sickened by Will's actions and called Hollywood spineless. Jim, your people is Hollywood. You haven't been sickened by all the shit they've done. We are from a country that turns a blind eye to Trump's assault on women. And all of a sudden, Judd and Jim, y'all want to speak up. There's many other times that y'all can speak up, baby. And there's so many other instances, and I hope that y'all watching have seen this, in which the Oscars were way more triggering and cringeworthy than this slap that Will Smith did. Okay, there was the year that uh, the native woman, I believe her name was Sasheen Littlefeather, who accepted Marlon Brando's award from The Godfather, um, and he allowed her to accept it to, to shed light on the fact that indigenous communities were not represented in the correct way. And John Wayne apparently had to be held by six had to be held back by six Oscar employees, you know, the, the theater employees. Okay, there was a time that we fucking uh, gave a standing ovation to Roman Polanski, who won a whole ass award and apparently had fled the U.S. because he was being charged with raping and drugging a minor. But we gave him a standing ovation. Okay? I'm not saying the violence was okay. I'm not saying that Will Smith was right in what he did. I'm saying that a lot of the response, a lot of the critique coming from white people specifically. I know there's a lot of folks of all different races, ethnicities that are upset and calling this an outrage. But just white people in general, the exaggeration. Speak up in other moments, baby. Hollywood is spineless only until it makes y'all uncomfortable. And we're seeing that. And we're seeing that the white men amnesia is real as fuck. Okay. I don't want to ignore the racial double standard because that is a real thing. He was protecting his wife and it wasn't OK, but I don't know where the fuck Will Smith was that day. OK, I know that on a bad day, if anyone said anything about Norma Tejeda, I would slap a bitch. And bitch is a gender nonconforming term here because it could be applied to anybody. I don't know. My mental health this week has not been the best. And I don't know where Wills has been. He's been he's been criticized all year for all that's come out about Jada and him being in an open relationship. His manhood has been challenged. Listen, people are calling him violent. People are calling him ghetto. Baby, white men have been ghetto. The Oscars have been ghetto. This country was born of violence. This country started ghetto. And y'all want to be upset because Will Smith lost his cool. And I know I'm going to have a lot of chit chat, chit chat, like, oh, there's different standards that white men are held to. First of all, duh, yes. Second of all, my biggest piece, and if you know me, you know this is something that I ride hard for, is accountability. Okay? We fuck up. Everyone is human. And I do feel like people who fuck up and are in higher positions of power, <coughs> Trump, <coughs> y'all need to do better in general because you are representing countries, right? Will Smith also has that platform. When you're held accountable and you publicly say, I fucked up, I messed up, I apologize, that holds power. And you still might be canceled. Some folks still might not respect Will for what he did. But I really respect that he apologized. I'm kind of upset at the fact that he said he was embarrassed because I just feel like the Oscars is just play to just make white people feel comfortable. Like, how do I got I to act at the Oscars in a way that's palatable to all these actors that do not represent us, that do not tell our stories well? Hollywood is still a, a majority percent white telling all of our stories last time I fucking checked. OK, so this whole performance, I'm, I'm upset that he's embarrassed and I hope he's more so embarrassed because for Chris Rock and then versus the Oscars. But there's just, it's, it's, it's layered nuances. And I just can, I am happy that Will Smith said, I'm sorry, because I do not see that accountability from a lot of other people who fuck up, who are in positions of power and who fuck up. OK, we're going to say that. So no, do I, I don't condone the violence. I also don't condone the attacking of Jada Pinkett. And she has alopecia. I don't know what the fuck her day looks like where she has to wake up and be upset at the fact that her hair is falling out or whatever else comes with the condition. We need to recognize these people as humans first and foremost. And humans can apologize. And many times white male humans who fuck up don't. OK, so let's go. Let's go there. As a celebrity, I feel like you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. And listen, hold me accountable to that. If I ever say some shit that's disrespectful, I want to be held and lovingly and in a way that hopefully folks know who I am. And if you hate on me for the rest of my life, I got to be able to deal with that because that's just the nature of the work when you're being visible. 
And it's something else that's layered and nuanced is the fact that Will then accepted an award and used and talked a lot about love in his acceptance. Sorry, I keep hitting the mic. He talked a lot about love in his acceptance of the award. And he said he's being called to love on communities. He's being called to to live through love, I believe. I might be exactly um, butchering what he said verbatim. I feel like I butcher what folks say often on the show. But essentially, we don't want to ignore that. Uh, violence is not love, right? I feel that a lot of folks were responding on the internet to this saying that a lot of abusers use this language, right? Like, I hit you because I loved you, right? And so we want to make sure that we we note that love is not violence, love does not hurt, love is not pain. Um, but I can say that I recognize that in that moment, he felt like he wanted to protect and in that, that resulted um, him slapping Chris. OK, apparently O.J. Simpson and Alec Baldwin had shit to say. And listen, I don't even know if I want to get into it because it's just it's laughable that O.J. Simpson had a fucking opinion. And Alec Baldwin, baby, you got y'all just go just fuera. OK, the last thing I'm going to say about this is that I feel like people are taking sides. I feel that people are saying, oh, whose side am I on? Chris Rock, poor guy. You know, that's fucked up. I commend Chris Rock for also keeping his cool because there's many times where when you're on camera, so much shit is going on in the background and you're hearing about it. And you, when you're able to handle that shit, that's beautiful. He fucking treated that as, wow, that was shocking. But the show goes on. Right. So Chris Rock, uh, kudos to you. Um, but I don't think we need to take sides. I think we'll apologize. I think we all know that it wasn't the best move on Will's part. And I think it's beautiful if they're able to squash it. I don't, I'm not even going to judge the way if Chris Rock never wants to speak to Will Smith again, baby, do you um, in short, Will lost control, right? We're going to chop it up to that. People are also saying he needs therapy. Like, that's a bad thing. Like, oh, he needs therapy. Baby, we all do. And especially if we're so entrenched in this celebrity moment, and I am one that does that, right? I get involved because I do feel like these platforms mean a lot to different people watching. Um, but we could all use a little bit of therapy, okay? We all can. <laughs> that was a lot. That was a lot. Um, Besides from Chris getting rocked, though, another um, Oscar moment was John Leguizamo pointing out that the actual Oscar trophy was modeled after a Mexican actor. I think someone said it was Mexican-American, but I did my research and he was actually an actor from Mexico. His name was Emilio Fernandez. Um, and the supposed alleged story goes that Emilio was homies with a famous actress in the 20s named Dolores del Rio. And Dolores del Rio was booed up with someone named Cedric Gibbons. I said someone like people don't know Cedric Gibbons some people in Hollywood you know back in the day white people in Hollywood because back in the day Hollywood was even more white than it is now um, and Cedric Gibbons was tasked with with designing the Oscar award and Dol Dolores was like let me plug my homie Emilio real quick because he got some stature that I think would be a great model for the award and apparently that's who the award was modeled after in my further research, I say alleged because some people say that they called Emilio a mythomaniac, which is now one mine and the producers, one of our favorite words, because I'm going to just call everybody a mythomaniac. Um, so we're not sure if it's true, but if it is, and he was connected to these folks back in those days. So there is some layered truth in him being homies with the people who were designing the awards. If it is, fuck yeah, we're out here, okay? And if it isn't, Emilio, you still may change in Hollywood. He was a great actor. Um, he worked behind sets. His story is amazing. So if you don't know it, look into it. And yeah, that's a lot. A lot happened at the Oscars. There was a lot of cute outfits, too. I love watching Denzel talk about being on Macbeth. He said that if he could just act Shakespeare the rest of his life, Shakespeare and August Wilson, I believe, he would. So I just like, I like watching celebrities because we all glorify them so much, but they're fucking human, too. Uh, so yeah. We're going to move on to what's trending. What's trending this week? There's so much trending. The first piece we're going to get into is one written by our very own Hadley Tamiki with LA Taco, where he goes into crime targeting LA cannabis dispensaries hits an all time high. Y'all, burglaries and stick ups have increased so much. They've grown to four a month, from four a month to like 10 to 14 a month, essentially from this year to last year. From last year to this year, sorry. Um, a lot of these dispensaries carry cash and they're deemed easy targets for a lot of folks that are looking to just make a quick buck or not a quick buck. That's a lot of money that they're getting by stealing a a lot of the stealing a lot of the flour a lot of the money i always trip out when i hit up dispensaries too because i feel like i don't know for folks that have the privilege to uh, cross the border to go back when i would go visit family in mexicali just the rifles they would carry would be triggering to me i'm terrified of guns i'm terrified of being shot up randomly um and i just feel like some dispensaries here are are, are hit up with those kinds of staff members and that kind of security but i know that a lot of these dispensaries are legal some are illegal right um but they're being hit up so just keep through chat when you go visit to pick up your weed um ratero 
girls aren't backing down, y'all. Careful, butt heads. Um, to move on to disrespectful real estate news, uh, the smallest home in Venice is selling for $1.4 million. It's 560, 564 square feet. I don't have a lot to fuck to say except for Jesus. Location is everything. I don't know how close it is to the beach. $1.4 million for a tiny little home. I just, my heart goes out to all of us uh, millennials and all of us who are trying to buy a house in a place that we grew up in that we call our own. Like, real estate is just, is just fucked up. I, I, I see people say that they go on Zillow often. I couldn't. Um, it upsets me to see the gentrification and the increase in the housing market. Um, so, yeah, Venice. Yeah, I wonder who will buy it. I don't know. We'll see. Um, and the last piece that I really want to get into is actually something that I read on Knock LA. Shout out to Knock LA. I wanted to come back and report. I can't believe that it's been a year, but a year ago, the what we call the Echo Park Lake disaster happened. And our very own reporter, Lexis Olivier Ray, was there that night, essentially, a year ago, Mitchell Farrell and LAPD and a lot of other folks did a huge sweep of the encampment at Echo Park Lake and essentially promised the constituents of the area that all 200 people that were displaced, 209, were put into transitional transitional housing. It was such a dr dramatic moment. Um, a lot of folks woke up to fen being fenced into the park and then were, were displaced in, a, in such violent ways. A lot of folks had built such beautiful communities at Echo Park Lake. Okay, I want to point out that there was a community garden, a community kitchen. People had created makeshift showers. Like so much, so much beauty was built in the community of folks who resided there and they were violently displaced, apparently to be put into transitional housing. And a new study by UCLA showed that this was a lie. Okay, Mitchell Farrell promised these things, and the study showed that only 17 of those people were actually put into transitional housing. They actually made it. Apparently, uh, seven people have passed away since uh, that year, since that, since the displacement happened. It's just so upsetting to see that these brutal evictions happened and to layer it, right? Like I mentioned, our reporter, our investigative reporter for Ali Taco Lex was there and he was actually arrested along with so many other people who were there to protect, were there to protest for the community members. Even after he told the police, uh, the law enforcement that was there, that he was a reporter. So, so much fucked up shit happened. He wasn't the only reporter that was arrested. There were so many folks that were arrested in trying to just keep the peace and help and support folks there. And it was just a mess. And so, shout out to Knock LA for reporting and for the study done by UCLA. It's just really a failed attempt at supporting communities. And it just shows that we really need people. We need to vote locally and put people in the positions where they're actually supporting these communities. Because folks are part of our communities just as much as anyone else is. And it's fucking disheartening. And the last, the last thing that's really trending is that, y'all, Taco Madness has started, okay? You can now go to AlleyTaco.com and put your vote in for this first play-in round. This play-in round consists of four competitors that we've kept a close eye on over the last year. The winners of this pre-tournament wild card round is what we're calling it, are going to move on to the official bracket to be announced. Actually, it was announced this morning or going to be announced soon. Was it announced? Yes, it was announced. We have our social media person here letting me know through our special earphone. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so we get your votes in. Essentially, we want to know what Ali's favorite taco is right now. And we have a bracket filled with so many hard hitters in Los Angeles who are serving up some amazing tacos to community members. Um, so yeah, check it out. Put your votes in. We can't wait to see you at, at our Taco Madness events. It's going to be a great time. We love to bring it every year. So that's all for trending and news. Thanks for keeping up with me. We're going to go ahead and take a quick break and we'll bring it right back. It almost has like four eggs on it, five eggs on it. So people open it up and like, this is a huge sandwich. My name is Aaron Melendres, co-owner and chef of Temple Visions. Some of the things that we're known for right now is our egg salad sandwich. Uh, I took the influence, I guess, from like a Japanese egg salad sandwich to the egg salad that you used to eat when you were a kid. Found the fine balance and made something that was truly ours. I'm pretty proud of it because it comes on a really nice brioche bread. All the bread here gets buttered, toasted. That's Mando. Uh, we always believe in having nice crispy bread. A little spicy Japanese mayo right here. So it's soft, it has like this like subtle Japanese influence to it. Uh, if, if it hits the bun, there's a lot of thought and detail that goes into everything. Like everything else here, you get the pickled red onions. We still got beautiful heirloom tomatoes too. Okay, so we got a big lettuce stack right here. 
it's super enjoyable and very filling. Uh, if you look at it, it almost has like four eggs on it, five eggs on it, so people open it up and like, this is a huge sandwich, but that's what we are at Comfort Visions. Uh, we want to, uh, you know, provide a, a value to our guests. So every time you open a sandwich, you're gonna see this might be two meals. One thing that you can always bet on here is our pastrami sandwich. We use the same pastrami's they use at Langer's and uh, some of the other uh, big pastrami houses in LA. So that one is on uh, Hey Brother Baker uh, Alpine Rye Bread. So it's actually a beautifully balanced rye bread. Some people sometimes can be turned off by rye bread. It's like a little too sharp for them. But I think our rye bread kind of has this note of sourdough to it. Um, and the rye is very aromatic in it. So it's a perfect complement to the pastrami. I mean, who doesn't like a buttery ass rye bread? You know, like, <laughs> that's even like old school like diner shit though. We cut the sandwich that way, so I run my toppings that way. The pastrami is a navel cut brisket pastrami, so it has that perfect balance of lean and fat to it. So when you're eating it, it's just not dry. It has the perfect balance. So this is, a, this is the key right here. A blend of lean and fat, uh, even on the sandwich. This is already a good cut, but even my staff makes it, they know to blend the two well. So look for the perfect bites. One slice. Two slices of Swiss. Drop it in the toaster, we'll melt that Swiss down. On that, we do a little bit of a sour, like some fresh sauerkraut. Our sauce that we call 999 sauce, which is like a really spicy uh, Thousand Island dressing. So Uptown Provisions is located at 12819 Penn Street. We're in Uptown Whittier, but we're just off of Greenleaf. You can find us on Instagram at Uptown Provisions. You can find us on Facebook. You can find me here every day. Taco. It is a beautiful Saturday morning and we are here in Venice junto al mar with La Isla Bonita. We're here, we're going to meet the folks who have been here for almost 40 years. They've survived the waves of gentrification. We're going to know all about their story for the next episode of Hanging with Taqueros sponsored by White Claw. Welcome to we're here with Antonio Gonzalez. ¿Qué me trajo Antonio? Se mira riquísimo esto. Un coctelito de camarón de la Isla Bonita. Nos platicó José que ustedes le, le pusieron la Isla Bonita. ¿Por qué? Le pusimos la Isla Bonita por la canción de Madonna. Madonna. ¿A usted bueno, le gusta? Fue en el tiempo que andaba pegando esa canción. La Isla Bonita. Y pues se nos ocurrió ponerle la Isla Bonita. We're with Jose Gonzalez, who is one of the head honchos behind La Isla Bonita, supporting his parents out here. Jose, how are you doing today? We're awesome. At LA Taco, we hear from Memo over and over that the cocktail de camarón está riquísimo. Talk to us about that. Este cocktail viene de, de Jalostotitlán, donde vienen mis papás. De, de ahí trajeron todas sus recetas, todo lo que está hecho en la troca, no nada escopiado. Y qué te puedo decir, pues mi favorito y la favorita también de, de Memo es el cóctel, las tostadas de ceviche, pero también los tacos están muy buenos. Y me platican que les echan frijoles de la olla a los tacos, ¿por qué? Es único, vas a México y cuando pides un taco en México, el taco lleva frijoles. Los frijoles, they hit y'all, they add that little extra umph, we know it. You know we love those carne lizard onions. How long has the truck been? We know y'all have been here for a minute in Venice. What has that experience been like? Well, this is home. This is home right here. This is basically my house. The truck has been here since 1987, and well, it started in September 1987. I was born on November 1987, so me and the truck are the same age. Entre 40 años, tanto cambia entre ciudades, verdad? Para usted, qué cambiado más y cómo se siente sobre eso? Extraño mi gente, pero aún así vienen para atrás. Y ahorita, pues. Tengo poquito de todo. Es mi responsabilidad y me siento contento de servirle a cualquier tipo de gente. Qué bueno, la comida une, ¿verdad? La, la comida es una unión mundial. Wow.
What up, y'all? We're back. We just closed out with one of the trending topics being Taco Madness, and we're going to go ahead and start off with none other than Memo Torres himself to break that down. What up, Memo? What up, Laura? Last time we were at this desk, we tried some disre- disrespectful birria. Oh, the apoyo loco and the norms? The disrespect. Ugh. But then we, we came correct. You, uh, My palate redeemed itself. Or it wasn't my fault, but the palate <laughs> cleansed itself with the amazing tacos at Birria Mania. So kudos for that event, yo. Yeah, it's such a stark contrast, right? Yeah. You know, having that... <laughs> Flavorless, like listen that that fucking Taco Bell sauce consomme compared to Goat Mafias or Villa La Unica or Teddy's. All the consomme was really really good. Yeah, I mean shout out to all of the competitors because yes. you guys were all delicious and everybody kept coming up to us and being like, oh I love Del Birria, I love Don Boni, right. I love Barajas, and everybody swore they had the winner picked. But um, it's just so hard, and like literally, we had the boxes, and people were just like, oh, "I know." Somebody even like ripped their voting ticket in half and put both. <laughs> Listen, that's commitment. I did get in the reel that I posted. I got a little clip of someone who was literally staring at the boxes so intensely. Yeah. they had their ticket, and they were just looking at the boxes. So everyone was a heavy hitter. Yeah, and people took it seriously, and we appreciate that. I mean, nobody takes their taco game more seriously than LA folks. So yeah. Gotta love our tacos. That was some LA shit. I was talking to Mala on the side and she's like, we're at fucking Biria Mania. And I was like, right? It was <laughs> it was a beautiful event. So I can't wait to see it happen again next year. But let's get into the next big thing we got coming. Yeah. Break down Taco Madness for us. I've only joined as a guest myself because I started working with LA Taco during the pandemic. So I feel like a lot of virtual things went down, but I haven't attended as Laura myself now <laughs> in, in since 2018. Yeah. So what do we got to look forward to this round? All right. So for everybody that doesn't know what Taco Madness Madness is about. It's basically like March Madness, the NCAA kind of styled um, bracket. We have 32 taqueros that were picked by committee at LA Taco, and we put them on a bracket. We seed them from first through 32nd. Um, there's a bracket up right now, and um, yeah, we go around, we we match them up, and it's a week by week process. So every week. Everybody in LA, go online, go to LATaco.com. You'll find this bracket through our article um, and vote. Vote for your favorite taquero. Now, a lot of people are going to vote for their taquero that's locally. Some people are going to vote for, like, you know, whatever's in their city. And some people are just going to vote for the favorite taco that they like. But whatever the reason is, go out there and vote. Sometimes people think that because some of these taqueros have, like, large social media followings, like, Tacos y la única, or Teddy's Red Tacos, which, you know, have hundreds of thousands of followers on their socials, have the upper advantage, but that's never the case. Yeah. I've seen people with, like, maybe two or 3,000 followers at a time beat out these large behemoth social media followings that these other IG accounts have. So it's not always about social media. It's not always mm-hmm. about following. It's about loyalty. Who are these people coming out to these taco spots? Yes. And there's so many good folks here. Do you want to shout out any specifically? We do know that Vias Tacos came hard last year. Vias Tacos created a whole documentary, Echale Ganas. Yes. Uh, based on their journey creating Vias Tacos, which happened in 2020, right? Yeah, that was, an, that was a beautiful story, by the way. So, so somebody reached out to Vias Tacos, who was our champion last year. They took the whole thing, and it was a hard-fought one. I mean, they went up to, like, we're talking about people with large social media families, they went up to get like Tacos El Venado, Angels Tacos. I mean, they went up to like, they were like oh, the geez. underdogs. Yeah. yeah, underdogs. And they squeaked by on a lot of these. Um, so shout out to Via. They're back and they're hyped. They're ready. They already got their videos up on IG and that, that's a fun follow. So yeah. I highly recommend you guys follow these taqueros on IG um, because they get into it. They'll post some crazy ass yeah. fun videos. They have ways that they ask folks to vote. Listen, people get into it. And I'm here and watching all the competition because it's always so friendly. And what I love to see the most is that there's people from all over Los Angeles who ride hard for their truck, right? Like even just looking at the list myself, I've got into a really cool opportunity to meet a lot of these taqueros through the Hanging with Taquero series we have with White Claw. Shout out to them. And these stories are so beautiful too. Like Carnitas del Artista, they're joined by a 16 year old Kevin who helps them, like wakes up at 4 a.m. He's a high school student who wakes up, an A student as well, by the way, who wakes up to fucking make these carnitas that people like religiously go and eat in Inglewood, right? It's just when you really get an opportunity, if you haven't seen the series Hanging with Taqueros, check that out on our YouTube too. But you'll get to know a little bit about their story. And I feel like the taco just tastes a billion times better knowing who's creating it for you. And all of these folks in the bracket have beautiful stories like that. So, yeah. Um, and but uh, so let's talk a little bit about who's on there. Right. Mm-hmm. 
so we have our, our, our repeat. So we, we, we try to make this bracket balance. We try to have some of the old school folks. We try to have some of the previous champions. We try to have some new people on there. We try to have people from different regions. And it's very difficult. Mm-hmm. I mean, we're talking about a city that has hundreds. A taco truck on every corner. Exactly. Yeah. We love it. We love it for that. <laughs> so we mix. We try to mix it up as best as possible. So I know it's going to be like, oh, these guys didn't make it this year. These guys didn't make it this year. Mm-hmm. You know, they might be back next year. But we got to get, you know, spread the love and spread the opportunity. But VS Tacos is the is number two seed. The number one seed is actually a Russo. He's mm. considered a, you know, he's having a moment with his flour tortillas. He's, a Russo is going to be going up to against Los Cocineros, which is a delicious vegan taco option. Um, I don't know if you guys remember a truck called Los Vegetinos. Mm. Yeah, so it's the same owner. Uh, the Vegetinos group kind of broke up and right before the pandemic, and he opened up Los Cocineros. He's in the Van Nuys right now. So he's going up to the Los Cocineros. It's their first time in. So if you haven't had a vegetarian taco, I mean, vegan tacos, I suggest you try them out. They're actually pretty delicious. Um, VS Tacos is the returning champ. He's going up against the Goat Mafia, who we just saw a Birria Mania. Listen, I don't know who I'm voting for yet because I do not want to be biased on camera in regards to that. But that's a tough, that's a it's tough, a tough choice. I mean, none of these matchups are easy at all. We got Virria Jalisciense. We got uh, going against Tacos La Carreta. We have Taco Sique, who like almost went all the way. Uh, Taco Sique is out in Whittier. Um, and they're, they're you, these guys, they're, they're a hype machine. So yeah. we thought they were going to go up against Villas Tacos. Unfortunately, they came up short against Tacos on Cuco. And the championship ended up being yeah. between Tacos on Cuco and Villas Tacos. And they came to the Taco wire. Taco Sique, you mean? No, Taco, Taco Sique lost to Tacos on Cuco. Be careful with the table. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Tacos que lasso tacos on cuco and then they was became tacos on cuco vias for the championship if I remember correctly. Oh yes, yes, yes. Yeah. yeah, And that came down to the wire. I mean, it was like listen, tacos que puts on a whole ass fucking party too. You're not just getting tacos when you go visit oh, them. Yeah. You're getting a whole ass show, a whole ass experience. Well, they're all like previous musicians, yes. so they bring out the DJ set. Um, so yeah, it's a fun vibe. It's literally gonna be so great. So make sure you go to LATaco.com to cast your vote. If you click on the tacos tab, you'll see the Taco Madness latest piece, and you'll be able to read a little bit more about the bracket that you're voting on. Make sure you go and vote, y'all. These folks, it, it, it gets crazy. Go on social media if you do have it. And I like what you mentioned about like folks not even having social media, knowing that Taco Madness is a thing. We want to make sure we keep, we we provide the key, the crown to the right folks this year. So help us out. Make sure to vote. Thanks so much for joining us, Memo. No problem. See you guys out on the bracket. Yes, we're gonna take a quick break and we'll be right back, y'all. Toasted tortilla, fried beans inside of it, asada tripa and a soft tortilla on the outside. This is a fire spot. We're here in Tijuana. We're gonna take them to some pretty out of the way spots. Super juicy and savory. Not the tourist stuff. Uh, taco safari, eat some bomb ass tacos. Doesn't even have a sign on it. It's a $600 struggle right there. I think I love it. This should be illegal. Sin palabras. It's delicious and I will definitely come back. Which I'm gonna take you. There's, uh, there's, there's ones that have a, a, a crunchy tortilla, beans, and a soft tortilla on the outside, which is basically just a fucking, that's it's just a grosseria, as we say. It's a pinche grosseria. There's a whole gastronomic space that just that just popped up in the Tercera Tapa Zona Rio, it's over here. It's like the, the, the sprawling, the, the, the urban sprawl is growing this way right now for Tijuana. And there's a bunch of food carts and people that are just starting off their like food and like food. oh wow so it's a few weird so, fusion mediterranean tijuana so you're starting to see i mean you're the baja med right the baja med yeah that's that's that's, that's, that's like the local thing everybody's trying to figure shit out that's where you get birria with ramen with, with, with yeah, you know yeah. that, that type of shit yeah do you think like tijuana can ever like gentrify can ever like become like a it's, it's becoming that you know it's, it's becoming a, that uh it's, if you, like i don't know if you saw when you crossed in tijuana's growing upwards now that's a sign of like, like an economic explosion and wealth, which is weird for Tijuana, you know, because Tijuana has historically been kind of like marginalized before. Yeah. But what's happening is that you have million dollar homes in San Diego and you have people that can't afford that and just live here. So like the housing market here in Tijuana is like going through the roof. Like the rents, like owning a house in Tijuana used to be like, are hey, you own a house in Tijuana? Property, the property is fucking becoming really oh, yeah. out of here. Los Carteles, the cartels are starting to like infiltrate and jack like whole tuna trucks, like yep. whole trucks full of tuna. 
because it's becoming like a it's becoming like an expensive commodity. It's, it's a the cartel cartel presence anywhere there, where there's fishing going on. I mean, there's people to tax. You know, there's there's product to steal and resell. Very desirable stuff that you know usually gets sold on the Asian black market. That's the main thing. And I mean, and cartels and people that are into you know diversifying their criminal enterprises have seen a very you know big opportunity to kind of capitalize. So it's a new it's a new it's a new it's, trade. It's 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 just one other thing that they do, you know, to get Got money. It. You know, uh, they're That's a diversified true. field. They, they don't just dedicate themselves to smuggling drugs to the U.S. They also have you know paid protection rackets. They own businesses. They you know they just any anywhere where they can get some cash is basically what they're gonna try and do. Un saludo para toda nuestra gente que se encuentra en Estados Unidos y toda la gente de aquí de México. De parte de Taco Chava, estamos para servirles, los esperamos con todos los brazos abiertos. The final stop for the head, is this uh, your favorite? This is one of my favorites, yeah. Toasted tortilla with uh, fried beans inside of it. And a soft tortilla on the outside to basically hold the whole thing together. Son tacos doraditos de frijol frito. Les ponemos carne, chorizo, lo que ustedes quieran. Lo podemos poner ahí dentro. Combinar como ustedes quieran, como ustedes. Sí, chorizo, tripita, asada, como hacer combinaciones. Ahora sí que si quieren con queso, le ponemos queso. We're in La Libertad. This is, this is a fire spot. It's your neighborhood, right? Yeah, so I grew up around here. Yeah, you, it's definitely you, my neighborhood. You, you, you used to uh, skate down these uh, these hills? Yeah, we used to you know lay on the lay on the board and just go, you know, go downhill. <laughs> I lost some skin on my arm on that one. I know some people are kind of nervous about getting out of the touristy areas, but you know, if people want to come down here, like, because you can see everybody's friendly here, it's like everybody's good morning, good afternoon, it's fine, yeah. it's okay, it's great, the tacos are fire. LA Taco Trip down, to, down into, into Tijuana with Ed Calderon of Red Manifesto. Thanks so much for watching, and uh, remember to come to Tijuana and eat tacos. Yeah. Salud, yeah. cheers. Welcome back, y'all. I'm super excited because now I am joined with a force, <laughs> with a mujer fiera chingona, Julissa Natzeli Arsraya. Welcome to the studio. How are you Thank doing? Thank you. You got them all in. Yes, all I had the to. Names. I had to. Listen, it says Julissa Arce, but I saw something yesterday that said your whole name, and I said, we need to honor that, okay? <laughs> Thank How you. How are you doing pretty... today? Good. I'm good. good. Yeah, glad to be here. You know, I'm a big L.A. Taco fan, oh, so this it. is... I'm, I'm a member, you know, yes. so it's, it's good to be here. It's so good to have you because we today are celebrating your birthday was yesterday. So happy birthday to you on Thank camera you. because that is exciting. <laughs> um, and you just released and I'm over here dramatically bringing out my copy. You sound like a white girl. The case for rejecting assimilation. This just came out last week. Yeah, last Tuesday. Yo, felicidades. Thank like I was you. just mentioning, this book is, I can't wait to get into it and hear about your experience and, and everything that you wrote and, and how you came to becoming this force that you are, right? Thank so you. let's start off with that. You know, like, como estas? But like, what brought you to this moment that we're here now where you're selling? This is not your first book. Mm -mm, you're making such one, yeah. amazing change. Thank you. That's where good did to it hear. Start? Oh, you really are. Like this, I want to bring you to Cal State LA, so we'll talk about that afterwards. <laughs> but <laughs> where did your journey begin in, in, in recognizing that you were this force? I don't know that I ever thought like, oh, I'm a force. I should do this. Um, it, it really... You know, I, I had a very different career mm -hmm. before I became a writer. I worked on Wall Street for 10 years mm -hmm. and um, had very different ideas when I worked there, to be honest. And at some point, though, I realized that my entire job was to make rich people richer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, I sort of took a step back and wanted to share my story of having been undocumented, of having worked on Wall Street while I was undocumented. And once I started sharing that story, I had an opportunity to write my first book. Yeah. And um, something really amazing happened because when I first started writing that book, I thought, I'm writing this book to change the narrative mm. around what other people think of immigrants. The perspective of us. Right. But then the beautiful thing that happened is that people who were reading my first book, who were undocumented or had been undocumented or whose parents were undocumented, mm -hmm. 
the notes that they would write me and the messages that they would write me, they were so energizing mm. and so motivating. And um, I realized that, you know, I wanted to write more books for them. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to convince people that I was human. Yeah. I didn't want to spend my time going on Fox News anymore yeah. and, and talking to people who are probably never going to see me as American, who are never going to see me as fully human. And I didn't want to keep spending my dignity on them. Yeah, I, that energy. Yeah, so, um, so this book really is a bit of a departure from my other books because it's not a memoir. Mm -hmm. um, there are personal stories in the book, but there's a lot of history. There's a lot so of, um, you know, cultural commentary. And, um, and I was very clear in my intentions of like why I wrote this book. Mm -hmm. And this book is for the choir. You know, this book is not about changing minds it's really about empowering yeah us because what you really did was just provide facts to people mm -hmm. i do work in diversity equity and inclusion for college students and specifically for a chicanx latinx student resource mm -hmm. center and when i was reading your book it's so much knowledge that i, I have the privilege to have learned because mm -hmm. i was a part of an activist family and I, I did i took ethnic studies courses but a lot of people don't right, right. so in reading the way that you broke down a lot of the context for people when it when it when it pertains to like Mexico and what it was, right? Yeah. When it pertains to so much that people try to take from migrants, from from people who are Mexican, right? I was just sitting there like, this is so necessary. Mm. And then the narrative that you connect, right? It's not something that I was reading that I was like, oh, it's a history, it's just yeah. like a lesson, but you're connecting like, this is what my experience was in learning this, or this is what this means when we, we're tried to, we're, we're stifled, yeah, right? So thank you for that. Yeah, you did thanks. it in such a beautiful way that I feel like made it super palatable to folks who otherwise might not have access to this information. Yeah, I mean, that's part of what I talk about in the book, right? It's mm -hmm. that I didn't learn this history until I was much older mm -hmm. and it makes me so angry and sad that that knowledge mm -hmm. is so often only accessible to college students or people pursuing PhDs in yeah. Chicano studies. And I didn't take any of those classes when yeah. I was in college. So I really, privilege. yeah, it really is. And so I wanted to um, take sort of all the academic works that I read and I studied in research for this book mm -hmm. and, and sort of make them more accessible to everybody, to more people, and to also make the connection between the issues that our communities are facing today yeah. are rooted in the past. A and there's percent. a history to what is happening today. And yeah. so I wanted to connect the dots between things like police brutality mm -hmm. in Latino communities and the Texas Rangers yeah. uh, in the 1850s and how those things are connected, mm -hmm. you know, because history just doesn't tell us of the past. Like it really informs our present mm -hmm. and tells us of our future. And so um, I'm, I'm glad to see that that, that, came, it, that came across. It really did. And I can't wait to actually sit down and like read it with a book club because I think that <laughs> I learned so much in hearing how other folks what they receive as well. I feel like we all receive different things when we're reading. And so that was what it was for me, but we are gonna read that at my place of employment. So it's gonna be oh, great. Oh, I love that. But what was that? I'm curious. So you mentioned working at Goldman Sachs, being a badass, okay, an executive at Goldman Sachs, right? Mm -hmm. What was the moment that you realized like, fuck this, you know, yeah. like this is, I mean, you're still a force in that realm, right? Because you you did that, you made that, you yeah. gave representation to so many people who still might aspire to work in finance, which people still sh should want to do yeah. that if they can, right? Um, and I feel like you're making it so that folks are in those places and also challenge, continue to challenge what we need to because I don't know if we're gonna see it in my generation where there's a lot of change, but things like this book remind me that we're doing something, right? Yeah. So what was that moment for you? So I think I have to take I have to take a little bit of a step back and um, tell you and people watching yes like why I wanted to go work in finance mm -hmm. in the first place right so I was a sophomore in college and I saw this poster mm -hmm. that said you can make ten thousand dollars working on Wall Street for the summer and I was like oh my god ten thousand dollars ten weeks ten thousand dollars like that was so much money like I couldn't even imagine that yeah. much money right and. I thought that's where I need to go work. Like I didn't know what Wall Street was, but I knew what ten thousands could ten thousand dollars could do for my family. Yeah, and um, you know, quite frankly, the reason I went to go work on Wall Street is because I wanted to make money, mm -hmm. and I wanted I had the responsibility of taking care of my family, yeah. of taking care of my mom who had gone back to Mexico because she'd had an accident. Mm -hmm. uh, my little brother had gone back to Mexico with her, and. Um, my dad and I wanted to bring my little brother back. There was like all of these responsibilities yeah. that um, 
that I had on my shoulders that I, at that point in my life, I couldn't really ask myself, what do I want to do with my life? What am I passionate? I didn't have that privilege. What do I want to do with my life? Like those thoughts didn't cross my mind. Mm -hmm. What was crossing my mind was how can I make as much money as possible? I'm here to get a degree and then where am I going to get a job to pay for all these things? Exactly. And so that very much drove my interest in Wall Street and what kept me motivated and what kept me working on Wall Street for for ten years, um, you know, I did also enjoy my time mm-hmm. on Wall Street. Like I, I I learned a lot. Like the fast paced environment was something that really um, vibed with my with my personality. Yeah. Um, and so it wasn't like all bad things, yeah. you know. Um, but when I finally got my green card and I finally felt like I had the money to have a safety net. Mm-hmm. in case I messed up, you know? So yeah. it, it was the think first, about that. yeah, it was like the first time in my life where I felt like I could take a risk on me. Mm-hmm. Like I had the money to take care of my family. And for the first time in my life, I could ask myself, what do I really want to do with my life? Authentically. Yeah. Like what's for me? Yeah. And, and it wasn't Wall Street, you know, for me, it wasn't Wall Street. Mm-hmm. For me, I'd always wanted to be a storyteller since I was little. I would like, write little plays and make my cousins act it out yes. during Christmas parties. I feel like a lot of us have those stories. <laughs> you know? yeah. I guess I, because we come from um, we come from a tradition of storytellers yes. and of um, of oral histories. Mm-hmm. And so I think that's just like in us, yeah. you know? Um, and then after I wrote my first book, I thought, okay, like this is something that um, that I can do as a career. Yeah. Like this is something that I can do professionally and um, now I'm on my third book and I've been very fortunate to be able to make a living being a professional writer, which yes. is also a big privilege. Yes. And, and I only was able to do it because I had that safety net that allowed me to sort of establish myself in this mm-hmm. new career um, without having to worry about how am I going to pay my rent. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. You touched on something right now and when you saw the poster about being paid $10,000 for a summer and and, and carrying the weight of being responsible for Mm -hmm. your family. That was one of the mentions. I wrote a lot of mentions that I wanted to get into. There's so many of them. We probably can't get into all of them, but (laughs) it's that connection that the weight, the, and I don't want to call it a burden because you didn't. You said it's not a burden, but it is a weight that we have to carry. Yeah. What was it like to navigate that as you are experiencing so much success? Yeah, so... um, you know, what I talk about in the book is um, that there is a really beautiful thing in our community mm-hmm. that we take care of each other, mm-hmm. we take care of our family, we take care of our parents. And at the same time, I want us, like, I want my retirement not to be my children, mm. right? Like, I want my children to be free of the responsibility to take care of me in my old age yeah. because that's a big responsibility yeah. and and it's not it's not a burden but it is a very big weight to carry especially as you know many of us are first generation college students mm-hmm. and then as soon as we get out of college we're trying to take care of everybody and everything even as we're struggling to make ends meet yeah. um, and pay back student loans and like do all these things right and so um I say in the book that I want like our parents' retirements to hold stock and bonds and yeah. not our dreams and ambitions um, because because it's a lot and it creates a lot of trauma yeah. and it creates a lot of sometimes um, fighting, you know, fights with yeah, our family when we have to say no yeah. um, and we don't know how to say no and so we don't take care of ourselves. And and I want us to kind of change that. And, and in the book, I talk about... Um, my husband's family, mm-hmm. uh, my husband's family being so different, right? Like when we go out to dinner, his parents pay for dinner. Mm-hmm. When we bought our first home last year, his mom sent us a check mm-hmm. to help us buy furniture. They give us a check for um, for our wedding. Mm-hmm. And I've never been used to that in my family. Yeah. Um, that's not something that, that, that I experienced. And the funny thing is, so... Uh, you know, I've been doing a lot of events on, mm-hmm. on, on book tour. And so I've, I've told this story, my husband's my husband's family story. And yeah. it's in the book also. And um, later on, my husband was with me. And so later on, we were talking amongst a group of people that showed up. And, and I was like, oh, this is my husband, Fernando. And they were like, this is your husband? Like, I thought he was white. <laughs> because because they're like, because of everything That's I described. That's how we perceive that. Yeah, right. like our perspective is that white families white do that. White families yeah. do that, right? And I was like... 
no, he he's Mexican, and and that's why. Um, that's why I wanted to share that story because mm-hmm. there are examples in our community yeah. of 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 how things could operate differently. Yeah. And I see the way he doesn't have. I mean, he has. You know, everybody has trauma. Like everybody, yeah. you know. <laughs> but his traumas are so different than mine. Yeah. Like he doesn't have those traumas yeah. um, because he he never had to have that responsibility mm-hmm. and. Um, and I just want us to create boundaries that are healthy for us. Yes. And it's not about, and I say in the book, you know, I don't want us to become a bunch of mal- malagradecidos. Yeah. Like, I'm so grateful. For, like, I wouldn't be who I am if yeah. it wasn't for my mom and my dad and my siblings who've all had to sacrifice. Yeah. Um, but I also want us to have healthy boundaries. And that's such a powerful thing for you to be writing in here because I feel like a lot of us are born with that default of. It, it's a given. We mm-hmm. don't question it. Like it's it's almost as if it's something that's ingrained in us, like any other normal thing, right? Like you wipe your ass when you shit. You <laughs> take care of your parents when they get older. Like that's literally. And reading your and, and I'm learning this through my mental health journey, in, in releasing a lot and setting boundaries with family. Yeah. Like I wasn't. A lot of us aren't taught that, especially for me, identifying as Mexican too. It wasn't. You listen to what your dad says. You listen to what your mom says, yeah. but you don't challenge under their roof, and you don't challenge after because you don't want to give them a heart attack or right. you don't want it, right? And so I think that's so powerful too in making that connection and allowing two truths to exist. Yeah, the truth that you have to be a healthy person and set a boundary, and the truth that you are so grateful for what your family mm-hmm. has done to lead you to this place. So I wanted to make sure to touch on that because I think a lot of women, like we hear the wo- the mother wound, mm-hmm. right? Like or even just like the parents wound for me, right? Knowing when I learned to like humanize my family, I literally lost it in therapy Mm. i was like wait what like learning so much and questioning things but that allows us then to create healthier boundaries and i really appreciate you for including that in the conversation because i still feel that that tradition still is alive and well and not that it's bad but yeah it's it's not okay to challenge right if you have the capacity to take care that's beautiful but many of us don't and we begin our journeys in college with that in the back of our heads and then we're always operating from a place of deficit yeah you know we never get to um we never get to a place where we have breathing room, yeah. where we have those safety nets. Yeah. Um, and I had to make some some difficult um, choices mm-hmm. in order to create that safety net. Yeah. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, it's been it's been worth it, and mm-hmm. I think my family has been understanding of it as well. Um, and it wasn't always easy, but I do think that having those conversations and being open about them um, is really healthy. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. I really wanted to point to that. Speaking of deficit, I want to go into your chapter or the section where you talk about language. Mm. I'm so passionate about talking about the fact that my brain, I I used to think about it as a deficit, right? We were talking last week on the episode with the fact that I mess up English idioms all the time. Mm -hmm, I'm always like, he threw me (laughs) off the roof, like all these things. And I feel like they're more exciting. I said that last week. But what what does that mean to you in honoring like your your tongue and honoring what our brains do? I think we're brilliant. I think the fact of folks who are bilingual, trilingual, who can speak multiple languages, Sometimes I think in English, but I speak in Spanish and vice versa. Like I'll think I'll think I'm talking English and I'll come out in Spanish and I'll expect people to understand who don't. And I'm like, oh, my bad. The yeah. brilliance just came out for a second. Right? <laughs> but can you speak to that? Like, why was that important for you to mention in the book or talk about? Yeah. So so the, the first half of the book um, is about the lies of mm-hmm. assimilation, the lie of English, the lie of success, the lie of whiteness. Mm-hmm. And then the second half of the book is about reclaiming, like yes. reclaiming all of the parts that I lost as I was assimilating for a long time yeah. and like putting those pieces back together. And I call English the first lie of assimilation because mm-hmm. we're made to believe that as soon as we speak English, belonging will be ours mm-hmm. and that language is a conduit to belong in mm-hmm. this country. Um, and you know, the way the reason the book is titled You Sound Like a White Girl is because this boy told me I sounded like a white girl and, and I thought disrespect. And, and he was your crush. Was he cute at least? He was very cute. Uh, <laughs> What was his name? <laughs> Fuck him. Just kidding. No, like, you know, and the thing is, I took it as a compliment. He didn't mean it as one. Yeah. You know, he, he he told me I sounded like a white girl, like it was a bad thing. But I was like, awesome. Like, I I'm finally sound right. like a white girl because yeah. I would stand in front of a mirror and try to enunciate my words like mm-hmm. the white girls in my school and like the white girls I was watching on television. Yeah. Um, and, and so I feel like English is this like double edged sword mm-hmm. for people who are, whose language is not in, like whose first language is not English, because as we're trying to attain this proficiency in mm-hmm. English, uh, you know, my Spanish suffered a lot mm-hmm. because of it. So then it's like, I still didn't 
I still didn't sort of um, have full uh, attainment of English. And then at the same time, like, I didn't have the language in Spanish anymore to like communicate with my mom. Yeah. Right. I, I talk about in the book how English sort of severs like the umbilical cord of mm -hmm. our mothers, like it cuts it because as uh. my life was getting, as I was getting internships and promotions and I, I couldn't explain, I could barely explain in English what I did mm -hmm. at Coleman, like let yeah. alone in Spanish. And so I remember um, not wanting to pick up the phone and talk to my mom because it took such mental effort yeah. to try to translate my thoughts in English to come out in Spanish. In Spanish. Um, and, you know, and, and because I was trying so hard for my accent to go away, I didn't want to speak Spanish because every time I spoke Spanish, my accent would like mm. pop back up. Yeah. Right. And, and that happens to me now. And to your point, it's like now I'm proud of it. Yeah. You know, now I find that there's a texture in my English and I feel like Spanish, um, Spanglish, it's a new language that we're creating yeah. and we need to view it as um, a sort of as beautiful as any other language because mm -hmm. language changes. It's wealth. It's cultural wealth. It really it? is. Yeah. And, you know, now I'm no longer ashamed when I say a bad word, or like not a bad word, but uh, the wrong word, mm -hmm. um, because I'm doing the best that I can. Yeah. I was in Mexico for um, uh, the first time that I that I presented my first book in Mexico. And I, I was like, in the book, I say that like, I felt like Frida, you know, like the first time she had a big show in yeah, Mexico. Yeah, what part of Mexico? It was in, in Mexico City. Oh, okay. And there were like 2,000 people that came out. My family was sitting wow. in the front row. My mom was there um, and she, because she can't come to the U.S. yet. Um, it was the first time that she was seeing me That's uh, so beautiful. with my book. And, you know, I said to the audience, I said, my Spanish is not that great, mm -hmm. but I'm going to do the best that I can. And I feel like people were really kind, except at the end, I was signing books and the last lady, of course, it's like always the last person. The last lady had made a list of all the things I had said wrong in Spanish. What? She was like, you were great, mijita, but like, these are all the things you said wrong. Not and like when you said too. this and then, Ugh. and I was like, señora, por favor, hice lo mejor que pude. <laughs> <laughs> You're a whole ass author talking about navigating this difficult experience, and she had to correct you. It's always gonna be that person. Oh, it's like I, I, I'm doing the best. I would I like can. to think that she was just holding you to a high standard. Maybe she just felt like she was a tia or something. Which even then, I would tell my tia to take two seats. But yeah, but, you know, because because I, I feel like in um, in Mexico, um, people can be very elitist and they can be oh. very classist. And let's get it's into like that. if you don't speak. If you don't speak this sort of academic, uh, high class Spanish, yeah. then then you're like looked down upon, yeah. you know. And like my own tias, if I say something wrong, they'll be like, "Oh, but this is una chalitla," and chalitla mm -hmm. are indigenous people in in our town. Anti blackness, and, anti indigeneity. That and lives I'm like, there, yeah. we probably are chalitla. Like I, yeah. you know, I did my DNA test or whatever, and <laughs> it's like 76 percent indigenous. And I'm like, yeah, like yeah. we probably are. Why are you denying it? You know, yeah. and, and like I, I love, I love that about about me. Like you can see it, you know, my cheekbones and my hair yeah. and in in my eyebrows, Our features, like, yeah. you know, and and I'm like, uh, it's, and, and that's why I talk about in the book when I talk about the lie of whiteness. Mm -hmm. I say that I learned about whiteness in Mexico. That's the first and place I learned it. That's what I want to get into next because I do feel like in the hierarchy of understanding equity and diversity, a lot of times Mexican folks feel that they get a pass because we're also marginalized in, in many different ways. And I really love the way you broke that down. Actually, I mean, I want to also connect the perpetuating the image of the perfect immigrant because mm -hmm. it kind of connects, right? But you really talk about how there is so much oppression that exists even within the systems in Mexico. Even like white Mexicans versus like black Mexicans right yeah. like a lot of people just hear Mexico and think marginalized immediately but they don't know the, the way that Mexico's government has even oppressed Central Americans right yeah. like so many other fucking countries yeah and and I mean and all of these systems are systems of white supremacy exactly and I have I, I have tried to be a little tender about it in the book because because you know these frameworks were inflicted upon mm -hmm. our people. Yeah, we're taught. We were taught. To we do were that. taught, and this is like centuries mm -hmm. of being taught that whiteness, that white is better, mm -hmm. right? The caste system that existed during colonial times really forced people. Mm -hmm. Like w whenever we hear this phrase, 
Cásate con un güerito para que mejores la raza. Mm -hmm. That has a root. Mm -hmm. And it was a very real way that people in colonial times could have a better life. Mm -hmm. Like that was the only way yeah. that people could move up the caste system, that their children could move up the caste system, that they could have a better life. Yeah. And so, so I sort of, I want to dismantle these things. Mm -hmm. And I also want to be tender about yeah. it because I'm like, I understand that if your only option to a better life was to marry someone white, mm -hmm. I understand why you would do that. At mm -hmm. the same time, you know, as I was learning all of these things and reading all of his history, I like wanted to like hold them and be like, let me tell you, it doesn't turn out the way you think yeah. it is. You know, like you're, I want you to fight for rights because as a brown person, as an indigenous person, you deserve them. Yeah. Not because somebody's going to view you as white or because you can have proximity to whiteness. Yeah. Um, And the things were so different in those times too, right? There was folks who were murdered for not mm -hmm. assimilating, right? The, yeah. the context was very different. And, yeah. and, and any move you you made in marrying into whiteness and your proximity to whiteness also had to do with folks' very it real survival. It was for survival. protection, Yeah, right? I mean, Many there's times. ways we survived through assimilation too, right? right. But back then, I, I like to think it was a little bit more hard. Yeah, like, I mean, like your life could depend, depend on, on it, it. Yeah, you know? Yeah. Um, so I, I really appreciate that care too. Sometimes I get too frustrated. Right? It's because it's like, <laughs> how many times do I have to say what you well, just said? Was problematic as hell well now yeah. you know now i feel like uh, when i mean tender i mean tender looking back at that history mm -hmm. um but i i'm not shy in the book to say yeah. we have to do better mm -hmm. we have to recognize that every single time we have sought protection and belonging in whiteness it has always backfired mm -hmm. on us and we must demand rights because as brown people As indigenous people, as Mexican people, we deserve those rights. Mm -hmm. Point blank, period. period. Not because of our proximity, right? right? Not because someone deems it, right? Right. Oh, we can go on so much more. The last point I wanted to make, because I do want to get into some fun questions. We love mm. to have fun here at LA Taco. Is just that idea of challenging the image of the perfect immigrant. Yeah. And I had a conversation earlier where I did some consulting about women and, and systemic oppression, and we talked about respectability politics. Mm. And I really want to say thank you for you um, for for painting that picture and for letting people know there's no right way to be mm -mm. an immigrant. There's no. I, I just feel like. There is that, oh, like they did it the right way, right? Do you yeah. want to touch a little bit about that? Yeah, so like in the book I say how, um, you know, I talk about how I struggle mm -hmm. with my own story mm -hmm. being inspiration for our communities yeah. and at the same time being used against our community mm -hmm. by other people when they point to me and say, look at her, she became successful, mm -hmm. she learned how to speak English, you know, and painting me as sort of this perfect immigrant. And then I'm like, I want you to know mm -hmm. that I used fake papers. Mm -hmm. I broke the law. Like I am not perfect, yeah. and 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 I have had opportunities that other people have not had access mm -hmm. to. I've also gotten very lucky, um, and there is no right way to come to the United States. Mm -hmm. You know, we're seeing it play out right now. And mm -hmm. I know you wanted this to be fun. Yeah. But <laughs> it's, it's <laughs> like, important. But, you know, like we're seeing this play out right now yeah. where, um, you know, the law that was used to keep Central American um, immigrants and asylum seekers out of the country, this like Title 42, that was used to keep them out mm -hmm. has finally been, you know, now we're like getting rid of that law in order to allow Ukrainian refugees mm -hmm. to come in. And like, absolutely we should be allowing re yeah. uh, uh, Ukrainian refugees to come in. And the way that we treat them and the way we're talking about them should be the way that we talk about and that we treat black and brown immigrants, yes. you know? Yes. So, so uh, I mean, over and over, and I talk about this in the book, but the, the right way to come to America has just to be, has to be, to be white. Mm -hmm. Like if you're white, that's the right way. Exactly. And if you're not white, then there's all these like obstacles these and, issues. And, and issues, you know? So, um, Yeah, that wasn't fun. <laughs> yeah, no, but thank you for breaking that down. But there is fun too. in the, I mean, not fun, but I do think there's a lot of inspiration. Yes, um, and people weaponize, right? Weaponize citizenship. They weaponize like, oh, you did it, you didn't do it. You must have not worked hard enough. Like right. that still happens. That's still that layered oppression that exists for migrant folks. So yeah. I needed to hit on that because that was important. And there's a billion more things, but let's just get into the fun, okay? What's your favorite food, Julissa? What do you love to grub on? Oh my god, we're gonna ask you the. Taco I feel like one this next, is gonna, but... this is gonna like. <laughs> People are going to throw tomatoes at me um, because we love unpopular opinions I, too. Okay. I, I really love pizza 
And we had someone last week share I, the same sentiment. I, you know, when I think about what would my last meal on earth be, I really struggle. Like, would it be a taco or would it be a slice of cheese pizza? And what would, how would you describe the best piece of pizza you've ever had? Or if you could create one in your head? I just, I love like a New York style mm. cheese pizza, yes. you know, just like thin and the marinara sauce a is little like greasy. has so much flavor. A little greasy. And then like you can just like pick it up and fold it in half, but it's not droopy. Mm -hmm. I just had one last week in New York and like my mouth is watering. Ugh, I lived in New York for grad school and I loved it because it was cheap too. I think yeah. it was two bros pizza that I would get like two slices and a soda for like two something yeah. back when I was in grad school and it was everything. It was yeah. sustained, it sustained me. Yeah, yeah, it really did. It really <laughs> did. Um, yeah, so, so cheese so pizza. pizza. Okay, we love that from New York. From New York, yeah. Is there any place in LA that you feel like you it has hit close? Prime Pizza. Okay, yup. I'm a fan. I go to the in one in Little Tokyo. LA is pretty good. And then there's Mike's Pizza, okay. like on Slauson. That's pretty good, too. It's good. Okay, gotta check out Mike's. Yeah. We love it. Okay, so now we gotta ask, what is your favorite taco? Like In Los Angeles or in general, the best taco you've ever had? At Ali Taco, we have to ask this question. The best taco I've ever had. Well... But it's in LA, right? Question. It has to be in LA. I mean, we love if you want to choose one that's not in LA. In LA, that's cool too because we love well, shouting folks out. I in mean, LA. my sister's here. Uh, <laughs> Your sister's looking at you like, say the right <laughs> thing, okay? <laughs> I mean, my sister uh, they don't they don't have a food truck anymore, but her and her husband used to have a food truck what? in in San Antonio. Okay, and like. I love my sister's tacos okay, describe and like it. she makes amazing Why is salsa. It amazing? Well, I think it's the salsa. Okay. You know, my it, mouth is watering. I, and I, I don't think even that know. I think that the the the, the secret to a good taco is like the tortilla and mm -hmm. the salsa. A like if you have good tortillas and good salsa and she had both. Okay. You know? What kind of taco in It was estilo? like tacos al pastor, it was carne uh, asada. Um I mean, this is not a taco, but they also made gorditas, oh. like like Texas gorditas. They were so good with picadillo. Mm. Mm. Um, in LA, there's a food truck on like 51st and like Normandy. Okay. I don't know what they're called, um, but it is bomb.com. Okay. 51st and Normandy, write it down. We got we to gotta go check it out. We got to report. We got to know yeah. what Jesus' favorite I got to take a uh, memo to yes. try them. <laughs> That's a whole segment right there. What can we look forward to next in your in your success? I know you just put the book out. So I let know. me not put the pressure. I like, am what so you, tired. What's next for you? Um, it's cool that that's rest too because we hope you're taking rest. Yeah. Um, I, I, I know that I have more books in me to write. Mm -hmm. um, but honestly, like promoting a book takes so much out of you. Yeah. Um, I wish that you could just write a book and then magically people go buy it. Yeah. <laughs> um, then I could write a lot more books. Um, but I'm gonna take I'm taking a little bit of a break yes. after this book and just kind of reset and um, yeah, I'll let y'all know. <laughs> yes, we're gonna follow closely your journey because we're big fans of you. Yeah, but for Taco. now, go get the book. You sound you like a white girl. To buy it, it is everything. I literally can't wait to keep reading it over because, like I said, I know I feel like I'm gonna pick up other things that I might have missed the first time around. Thank you so much for joining Thank us. Thank you. With us. Thanks for watching, folks. We're gonna take a quick break and we'll be right back. The biggest spoon. También a Osu era coyote. A mí me agarraron en Tijuana haciendo un coyote. También por eso es representa esa esa foto también. ¿Por qué? Porque me traía la la merca legal. Entonces de de coyote pollero ahora es bichero. Ahora marisquero. Dejamos lo malo por lo bueno, dice. Mi favorito, honestamente, de todo marisco es el pescado. Le voy a hacer un agua chile de pescado. Ese nadie lo va a tener. Yo nací en Anaheim, California. Yo a los 16 años me fui a Tijuana. Todo se al revés. Los de allá si quieren venir para acá, yo me fui para allá. Todo el mundo me decía que yo estaba loco. Honestamente, a mí me gusta la cultura allá. Para mi casa, mi casa es Tijuana. Como este va a ser agua chile. Este no va a ir picado muy delgado. Ahora vamos a cortar la mitad. Para que pueda tener textura. Exactamente el pescado está crudo. El, pesca, el camarón no te lo voy a cocer. ¿Ok? Ahorita lo que vamos a cortar va a ser el pescado. Porque el pescado si sí, buscamos que se curta poquito para matar la bacteria. 
siempre pimienta fresca, siempre. Uh, when I was a kid, my dad took off at a very young age, so basically all my bullshit, all the headaches, all the complaints, my mom had to do with them. So she's mom and dad. When I learned this, when I learned to make mariscos, I learned to make mariscos in Popotla. That's where I learned. Uh, I moved to Tijuana for six years. When I lived in Tijuana, I was doing other things that I should have been doing. I was doing other things that I should have been doing. I was doing other things that I should have been doing. I was doing other things that I should have been doing. I was doing other things that I should have been doing. I was doing other things that I should have been doing. I was doing other things that I should have been doing. I was doing other things that I should have been doing. I was doing other things that I should have been doing. I was doing other things that I should have been doing. I was doing other things that I should have been doing. Uh, let me tell you about Ceviche Rumble, man. 2019 is when I won my first title. I went back 2020 and I took it again. They won't let me compete no more because they think I'm buying the competition. My work speaks for itself, honestly. So, what can I say? Two-time champ, back to back. I'm kidding. Honestamente, para mí, mi favorito es el pescado. Un tipo con mexicano siempre camarón, camarón, camarón. Cada siempre lo miran como lo más bajo. Honestamente, si tú hablas con un japonés, un japonés sí te respeta el pescado, porque ellos comen mucho sushi, ¿hay que sí? Mm -hmm. That fish, that quality of the fish, nice thick cut. I appreciate that he's not chopping it up and grinding it up. Almost like a sashimi cut. That's an excellent aguachile de pescado. Probably the first aguachile de pescado I've had. The Cafe Baca style. Before I say bye to you guys, I want to say thank you to Ale Taco again. And if you guys want to find me, go find me on IG at Cafe Baja style. You can find me in Paris, or sometimes you might have to chase me because I bounce from city to city. I got to share the love. I'm breathing heavy because we're going to try tamales. Say, yes. it, say it with your chest, Walter. It's más rico, pues, más rico. It hits different. A bat comes in, eats the seeds, and then, you know, poops off the seeds around uh, And you school. need to look for those seeds that the bat pooped. <laughs> See, y'all, we talked about shrimp poop last week. We're talking about bat poop. Who poops sometimes is important, baby. Veo muchas pedas de vino en tu futuro, yes. I love that. So wineries is your favorite pastime. Yes. You want to shake it? Try to shake it. Sure. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I saw that TikTok where they you show like the people who are like casual, the serious ones. The, the different ones kinds of bartenders. Let me, not, let me not put egg all over myself. I'm about to have an omelet in my hair. You show up and these fools catfishing. Aye. Just mm -hmm. ugly, Aye. bad breath. <laughs> Outfits wasted. And for what? For 32 miles? I'm not down. No, there is no such thing as 32 mile dick. <laughs> not now. I mean, 26 miles, maybe. 25. Shout out to you, baby. <laughs> Walter! Walter! Right. Tequila just hits the throat and it's like a, you know, yeah. like mezcal feels like it, it as a party, right? Especially exactly. what you mix it with, yeah, or, yeah. Um, with the orange and all of that. So, yeah. wow, thanks for bringing that down yeah, for course. me. So I can get nerdy with all the tequila I'm stuff. I'm here for it. Of the tamal de mole from mi ranchito Veracruz. <laughs> this is also where we may fight because Laura stays balling on a budget. So yo como pescado catfish. Tilapia, what's the right thing to do oh, and what's the wrong goodness. thing to do? You already said it. We're going to start fighting We're again. We're going to fight again? <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't use tilapia for a ceviche okay. at all. When did you get to the point where you knew that you made it? Because when I found out you were going to be a guest on this show, I was tripping. That's when I knew. Yeah. <laughs> And now I'm Brendan, my manager was like, LA, LA Taco reached out. I was like, oh my God. You're like, it's I'm it. fucking here. It's it. I'm going to crunch it right into the microphone, okay? Yeah. Imagine if I have an allergic reaction to the spice because oh I'm, I'm a God, basic bitch. See? But how do you balance being a DJ, a business owner? And I feel like Cumbiaton is another business, Absolutely. right? Like, what does the balance look like for you? And what advice do you have for people who are pursuing these their passions in this way? So here he is. He's, he's breaking windows down. He's got the, sh uh, the shrimp shit there. Laura, do you eat this shrimp shit? I love <laughs> shrimp shit. I'm just kidding. <laughs> What's up, folks? We're back. What a great conversation with Julissa. I love breaking down um, the beautiful book that she wrote. But now we're going to move on to make our mouths water. 
because I'm now joined with Teddy Vasquez of Teddy's Red Tacos in the studio, the people's champion, Abiria Mania. Bienvenido. Gracias, gracias. How are you doing today? I'm doing amazing. Happy You're doing to be amazing? here. Yes, we're so happy to have you because we're going to get into your story. Te queremos conocer toda tu historia. So let's get into it. <laughs> How did it feel to be the people's champion, Abiria Mania? I'm beyond blessed and grateful. Yeah, <laughs> yes. why do you think y'all won? Um, I heard this is a bomb birria, so <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure if that's true. Yeah, I, it is. We yeah. love Teddy's Red Tacos. I definitely, I, I frequent the location in East LA on Whittier Boulevard often. Thank you. Appreciate for that. Yeah, it's really good. So let's get into your story, Teddy. You have so much rich history. LA Taco, we're big fans of Teddy's Red Tacos. Um, and we've written so many pieces, right? I say we like it was me, right? But so many legends at LA Taco have broken down your story and all of the in all of the ways that you've grown, right? When we first started, we started when you were driving for Uber. Do you want to get into a little bit about that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so my story started back in 2015 mm -hmm. when I was all depressed. I was down in luck. Um, I ended up being in TJ. Mm -hmm. um, I ended up in TJ because I I was depressed. And I wanted to go to Puebla, mm -hmm. where I'm originally from. Pero no tenía yo dinero, no tenía yo nada. Mm -hmm. Y mi amigo me invitó a ir a Puebla. Mm -hmm. ah, perdón, a, a Tijuana. Mm -hmm. Y yo, yo buscaba la manera de salirme de aquí. Mm -hmm. I was looking for a way out. So I... You know, I took advantage of the opportunity of, you know, leaving L.A. Mm -hmm. And he's like, Teddy, come on. You have so much potential, and I believe in you. And and you can learn how to, you know, um, cook birria. Yeah. And I'm like, you know what? I don't like to cook. <laughs> I don't like to cook. But, but he is, you know, he, he, he pushed it in, in me of, you know, come on, Teddy. Learn this. And yeah. you, you could probably do some so many things with this. Mm -hmm. And I was out there, like, for a year. And something clicked on me. And I said, what if God's trying to give me a different opportunity? Mm -hmm. What if, you know, what if it's possible? What if, and I and I started getting excited about it and came back to, to, to L.A. back in 2016 mm -hmm. and convinced my mom to give me a car. So she was. We love that. That's a good convincing. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was just trying to use my, my, my best sales techniques, <laughs> persuading my mom to, to help me get a car. Yeah. And thank, thankfully for that, she she um, she agreed for that, mm -hmm. and we got a car. Started driving for Uber for Lyft, and I was just driving like crazy. I owe a lot of people money, so I had to get my my, my um, get back on track. Yeah, I was gonna say you can say you had to get your shit together if you want to cuss. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Well, you pretty, you pretty much said it. <laughs> so. So I, little by little, I started buying my, my little mm -hmm. uh, uh, licuadora, my olla, and, and I was getting excited. I was getting, I was listening to a lot of motivation, a lot of audios on, 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 on my, I had a little AirPod. Mm -hmm. Yeah, AirPod. Like an MP3 player. A, a, yeah, something yeah. like that. Mm -hmm. With a lot of motivation stuff. Like, come on, Teddy, it's possible. It's yeah. possible. Don't give up. And, and I was just so, you know, like, I was just so you say energized um, energized yeah and then one of the things i learned is i had a good i i, I went to church mm -hmm. in actually in east la la soledad okay uh, okay Chavez. That yeah was, that was my church out there and i had a lot of anger towards my ex towards my dad towards towards myself mm -hmm. i felt like a failure so i asked god for for help mm -hmm. to help me forgive my 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 the people that had hurt me mm -hmm. And the second thing that I that I did is, I had to learn how to forgive myself. Mm, it's powerful. You know, because I had that anger that that I was a failure in my head. Yeah. And, I, and once I learned how to do that, how to forgive myself, it was like I was relief. I was fresh. I was clean. I was. Mm -hmm. You I was, let go. I, I had let it go. Mm -hmm. And in order to to grow, you have to let go. Mm -hmm. And and that's what I did. And with that, I started getting excited. I started being positive. I started being um, grateful. I started being more, more optimistic mm -hmm. in life. I need to listen to these motivational speakers because listen, you're speaking to me. I said, shoot me the names of these people after the episode. <laughs> of course, <laughs> of course, because we all need all this stuff mm -hmm. in life. Whatever you, we have going through, we need the little extra push. Yeah, the support. Yeah, you know? and especially if you're trying to accomplish something in life or, or just get by your daily activities, you mm -hmm. we need all those positive yeah. stuff. 
especially in the times that we're, we're in mm-hmm. with so much negativity, so much fear, mm-hmm. so much um, sickness. Mm-hmm. Uh, we need to st- step away from that and, and listen to to uh, um, people that say, yeah, you know what? It's possible. Yeah, you could do it. Who cares if you're past? Who yeah. cares if you fail before? Who yeah. cares? Who I love cares? it. And so I want to hear about your strategy. Listen, Teddy, you had a genius strategy as you were driving for Lyft and figuring your shit out with with cooking the birria right and becoming this force that you are in Los Angeles. Can you please share with the viewers or folks who might not be aware of what your marketing strategy was in the very beginning? <laughs> it, it was called desperation. <laughs> <laughs> desperation, being broke. And, and, you, and creative. We had to have a little bit of everything. Mm-hmm. So... I was, I was just so, so crazy, so you, crazy. You would put it in the trunk of the car. Yes, because you know, back in October 2016, mm-hmm. I decided to open my my taco stand. Mm-hmm. You know, a little olla, a mesa. Y puestecito. Yeah, but nobody knew what who was Teddy. Mm-hmm. You know, it was in the back of a warehouse, and people were like, "Este güey, you know, yeah. qué rollo, quién es Teddy?" <laughs> like, no, I wasn't selling anything at all. Yeah. So I was like, man, this is not working out. Mm-hmm. So I would put my stuff, everything in the trunk of the car. Mm-hmm. And I would turn my app on and let's go back to work. You know, let's come on. I need to make money. Mm-hmm. I need to make money. And, and and people, you know, started asking me, hey, what's the smell, Teddy? And I'm like, hey, well, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> you know, I'll pull over and think, you know, this is before COVID. You know, yeah. if you do that right now, it's just so weird. Mm-hmm. But this is before I mean, COVID. not for me. If I was a passenger <laughs> and you did that on me right now, I'd be like, oh, listen, yeah. let's get into it. <laughs> and I was just so excited. So I would pull over and I would grab like a tostada mm-hmm. and I would dip it in the, in the, in in the, the meat. Consume la carne, in huh? the carnita. And like, hey, you need to try this. This is like one of the best beers ever. And like, really? And it, some people look at me kind of weird. Yeah. But I wouldn't care about those. You know, yeah. I was just trying to feed my energy mm-hmm. towards them. Yeah. How can I get them to try it? Yeah. Because I always trying to get customers mm-hmm. because I was just, anybody that would listen to me, I would let them know. Yeah. You know, you, you need to, uh, my, my goal was to the whole week driving day mm-hmm. and night to get as many customers to my taco stand. Yeah. That was my goal. And in order to do that, I had to be excited, mm-hmm. had to be positive, and I have to be uh, creative. Yeah. And that, driving for Uber with a pot of birria in the trunk was very creative because the smell was like, hey. You pass by any. When I go jogging around my neighborhood, which I haven't done in a long time, <laughs> y huelo la comida, pa, casi quiero tocar a la puerta. Like, ¿qué haces, señora? ¿Le puedo comprar un plato? Like, the smell, right? Sí, yeah, huele sí, rico. Sí, 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 and sí. people are going to want it. So that proved. And, and now you own 11 locations. That's correct. You all, Teddy's exists in 11 different places in all over Los Angeles. And that is amazing. What does that feel like to know that you started asking people? I mean, when you think about it, it's hilarious. I'm the kind of person that would have been like, listen, I got tortillas in my purse. Let me <laughs> help you warm them up. I'm sure some people looked at you like, what is this fool offering me? Right? Right, right. right. But what does it feel like from going to that to now where you're at now? It, you know, it's like a dream come true. Mm-hmm. Looking back. You're like, wow, this is this is amazing. Mm. You're just like, you know what? A couple years ago, I was that broke. Mm. Now, well, I'm not that broke anymore. <laughs> 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 and, and it feels pretty pretty amazing, you know, yeah. pretty amazing because you, now you can give back. You can get, you can create create um. Puedes crear memorias. Mm-hmm. Puedes ayudar de diferentes maneras. Entonces, it's about you know having goals, having that ambition. Mm-hmm. When people are criticizing you. What are you going to do? Mm-hmm. Are you going to let yourself go because um, maybe a, a family member didn't support you? You know, like sometimes the people that we love the most are the people that that they don't see the vision. Mm-hmm. You know, like my mom, I love her to death. But she's like, Teddy, just get a real job. Mm-hmm. Teddy, you, you don't know how to cook. Our families are our worst critics sometimes. And I'm like, Mom, you just have faith. You know, yeah. espérese, espérese, todo va a salir bien. Mm-hmm. Even myself, not knowing how was that going to be possible, yeah. but I had to have faith and listen to our audios. Like, Teddy, don't give up. Mm-hmm. Come on. Come on. Uh, if you tr- try this, didn't work, try something else. Yeah. Try more. Get more excited. Be more happy. Be mm-hmm. more grateful. And I started applying all those things. Mm-hmm. You know, si la montaña no va a ti, tú ve a la montaña. Mm-hmm. All those things that... Be the that, mountain, shit. You know, yeah. <laughs> you know? So so I wasn't just stuck waiting for customers mm-hmm. to, to get to me. 
I was just trying to, you know, like do something different. How do like, I get to them? Is what you right. did. I just want uh, as many people to know that I'm Teddy's or Tacos and mm-hmm. have like a delicious birria. And you do. So let's get into that. Let's <laughs> okay. talk about let's the birria. Go. Listen, our editor Javier Cabral did mention that he's recognizing that a lot of the folks that are forces in Los Angeles are from Coatzinga. 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 Coatzinga, Puebla. Coatzinga. Look at me, Coatzinga. Mm-hmm. Coatzinga, Puebla. What do you think is in the masa that y'all are eating out there, that y'all are coming over here and, and sustaining all of us in Los Angeles? Where, where is that connection? What What do you think makes your birria so great? And I can vouch that it is amazing. You know what? Um, maybe because we, we do it so, with so much passion, so much love. Mm. That's what it is. You know, yeah. like when we when we started Teddy's, um, I wasn't trying to compete against anybody. Things happened because, you know, I don't know, maybe it was my destiny. Mm-hmm. But I wasn't, back then we had no, it was only a few of us that were doing birria. And and especially because I know other, my, my competition mm-hmm. and we're from the same town, that's why I created something totally different. Mm-hmm. What know? do you think makes studies different? Everything. Everything, because I'm not a copy of anybody else. Mm-hmm. You know, like, I don't even call myself birria. It's not even a birria or taqueria. Mm-hmm. I wanted to go more, more like, worldwide mm-hmm. in the sense of you know like anybody knows who, who's what a taco is yeah and red and it's just different yeah you know so i, I wanted to be different and we we i think we've shown that enough mm-hmm. that that we just have a different mindset yeah and it's, it's a different vibe and there's so much space for such am- amazing tacos de birria but you do y'all do work hard in setting yourselves apart you mentioned that um, you lived in Tijuana, and I read somewhere that you also worked in a birria in Tijuana. What did Así you es. learn? ¿Qué aprendiste? ¿Qué te trajiste a Teddy's? Like, was there anything that you owe your success to in all the journey you had before being this birria force in Los Angeles? Or this taco force, I should say, right? <laughs> pues sí, yo, yo le, le debo mucho a, a mi gran amigo que me enseñó ahí, ahí en Tijuana. Mm-hmm. Él como, como trabajaba. ¿Cómo se llama? Se llama Bonnie. 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 Okay. Bonnie. Bonnie's out here. There's a lot of yes. Bonnie's in the world. Cooking <laughs> <laughs> good birria. <laughs> sí, se llama Bonnie y okay. todo. Y mire cómo, cómo trabajaba. Mm-hmm. Yo nunca había trabajado en un restaurante, en una birrería. I had no idea. Mm-hmm. But I asked myself, how can I do it better? How can I do, from, how can I do it different? And if it was me, you know, how would I, you know, we just started thinking. And I put my, my mind to, to start thinking mm-hmm. and getting, getting excited. I'm like, what if I do this? What if yeah. I do that? What if it works? What if it's possible? Yeah. And I just, I, and I just pretty much, the thing with me, yo me engaño mucho. Mm. Yo me engaño diciéndome, hey, Teddy, what if it's possible? Mm-hmm. What if you can open a restaurant? What yeah. if you can open a drive through What if you can open another restaurant? What if it's possible? What if it works? Yeah. And I tell myself those things. And I encourage people that are listening to this um, message, you know, when you're faced with uh, an obstacle, any kind of obstacle, instead of saying, oh, what if it doesn't work? Mm-hmm. What if it's hard? What if, you know, this, this, and this, and that? Change it up a little bit and and start saying, what if it's possible? What if it does work? Yeah. Yeah. Or in Espanol, ¿qué tal si sí? ¿Qué tal si sí? ¿Qué tal si sí? ¿Qué tal si sí? ¿Qué tal si sí funciona? ¿Qué tal si dicen que sí? Lo positivo, yeah. not, the, not the deficit Because, thinking. Especially yeah. in our community, we're so, um, oh, no, no. No, no, ¿cómo crees que te van a dar crédito? ¿Cómo crees que vas a calificar? Uh-huh. Oh, ¿Cómo no. crees? Yeah. No, ¿Cómo crees? ¿Cómo crees que sí? Yeah. ¿Cómo crees que sí? ¿Cómo, ¿Qué tal si sí? ¿Qué tal si sí es posible? ¿Qué tal si sí pueden abrir otro estudio más grande? Uh-huh. Con más personas, con más miembros. Listen, you're preaching to the choir. Ok, you know? Teddy, you got us out here. <laughs> you know, ¿Qué tal si sí? So, ¿cómo, ¿Qué tenemos que hacer para hacerlo más grande? Yeah. Para, ok, ¿cuántos, ¿cuántos miembros tenemos? ¿Cómo podemos llegar al doble, uh-huh. al triple? What do we have to do? What are uh, what we slacking? You, and what did you do? I'm curious. Like, what, what do you owe your success to? Aside from this, it's beautiful to know that your motivational. You're motivating me right now. Like, I, I need to. <laughs> I need to take a lot of what you're saying and practice it for myself. But who, who has been supportive for you in, in throughout this all this success? Supportive in what way? Supportive in making eleven locations happen. What What do you owe that to? Um, first of all, to God. You know, for, to God for for. Él, él, él nos va a dar algo que no podamos um, controlar, uh-huh. ¿me entiendes? Y yo siento que Dios tiene, no, y a, nos da la capacidad para hacer, pero también nosotros nos, y nos da el, el poder para realizarlo. But the question is, what happens when you're faced with an opportunity? 
Because a lot of us get an opportunity. Mm -hmm. Everybody, you know, I don't, I don't think I have the best birria, um, or I, I'm not the, the inventor of birria. But when I was faced with an opportunity, instead of saying, oh, no, I don't think that's possible for me. I switch it up and I say, what if it's possible yeah, for me? What if, it what is? if this is the vehicle that's going to allow my family to have a better lifestyle? Mm -hmm. What if it's possible? And even though no one believed in me, I was my, the hardest believer myself. Mm. And that's what we have to do. Yeah. We, you have to believe so much in, in whatever you have going on. You have to get excited. You have to be positive long enough until you until, reach it you reach the goal you know because this is not my first business that i tried mm -hmm. i tried several businesses prior to you know to teddy's so when the opportunity came i had already i was already you know like excited i was already motivated I'm like, and, and, and you you have to continue trying until yeah with, with excitement with with creativity and and another thing is you ha you want to be original. Mm. You you don't want to be a, a copy of somebody else, because you know like you you want to stand a, a apart from the crowd. Yeah. You want to be with with your with your style. Yeah. So I have a question in regards to the birria. Okay. Why the res y no the chivo? What's your commentary <laughs> on that? Because growing up, I my mom was like, oh birria es chivo, birria es chivo, but she used to make birria de res at home too. And I, I have this joke that I shared at the very beginning of the episode. Episode I said, I never was a fan of goat growing up porque sabía como que mordía el chivo. Right. Like for me, it's like I can, like I, I feel like I'm biting it. And, and maybe it's my palate. Everyone has their gustos because I know people come for me. My own cousins are like, how could you not like goat? You know. And I, and I have tried goat, and now I'm starting to like a little bit more. But I know a lot of folks say that in Los Angeles and beyond, right? Like no, birria es chivo. Like why for for Teddy's was it the res? Y no chivo. Well, it's because that's what I learned. Okay. My friend in TJ is Vida de Res Estilo Vida Tijuana. Vida de Res Estilo Tijuana. Mm. Y eso fue lo que aprendí y eso fue lo que yo, yo hice. The difference is I, I put my, my style to it. Mm -hmm. Tu sazón. Do my, you want to share a little bit about your sazón with us? Okay. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what is it? What's your sazón? What do you think? What, what makes it special? Oh. <laughs> I mean, I don't want you to give us your secrets, but you're like, you're girl, next spot, question. You're putting, yeah, you're putting in the spot. Like, I don't even know the, the recipe anymore. <laughs> but it's special. It has that Teddy flair. You know what? I think it it was just meant to be. Yeah. It it was just meant to be because, like I said, I've never been a cook before. Yeah. So they taught me, hey, do this, this, and that, and this comes out. Yeah. And I did it, and hey, and what you if kept we trying? What if we did do this? What about if it is, hey, I like it. Mm. I like it. You know what? This is going to be it. You were just testing it. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a birria craze, like you said. You don't, you know, you say that you're not the best, but you are, are you set apart from the crowd, right? I, I love, there's so many places of birria that I love. What's your opinion on the birria craze of all the different, like, fusion people make, right? There's like the, the, the quesabiria is not that wild, even though some folks are doing it, right? A lot of people are doing quesabiria. It's new in comparison to the taco, but birria ramen, the birria egg rolls, the, the all these things coming up. Are you a fan of those things? I'm excited. You know, yeah. I'm excited that all this created a, a whole different, a whole different, um, ¿cómo se le puede decir? A generation, a, whole, a, a yeah. wave. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. birria has been around for years. Mm hmm and, and you know like it's not uh, new no yeah. but before you know even when i was i was you know back in 2017 um, when i when i started the food truck and people la gente ranchera llegaba like hey teddy quiero birria le digo claro que sí jefe también pero quiero un plato con tortillas mm. oh sorry jefe como un caldo sí so, the, the, the typical that, was, that yeah. was a traditional rolled up tortilla to and, dip the tortilla and con I'm un like, arrocito le digo jefe no vendemos uh, en plato Oh, pues, todos que chingados venden. Le digo, no, pues es que es así en un plato con caldito, quesadillas. quesadillas. No, 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 yo no quiero. Le digo, permítame, jefe, venga. Uh -huh. Try it out. Yeah. Oh, wow, está bueno esta madre. Y, <laughs> <laughs> vieja, vente, dame cuatro y cuatro. You know? Yeah. And, and, but I had to kind of teach people yeah. that is, you know what, We're, that's the old school. So this new generation is really getting creative with the ways that birria is being served up. Right. Yeah. So now a lot of people are using the creativity with, you know, with all this, with pizza, with burritos, with tortas. I'm like, wow, that's pretty cool. Yeah. You know, like, I, I like that. 
you know, I'm like, what else can they do? You know, what else can we do? So, yeah, I'm excited for all that. Yeah, I love it. Thank you. Let's get into your family a little bit more. You said your mom in the beginning, too, had doubts, right? And shout out to her for supporting you and buying your car when you were starting. What has been your family's response now that you are, th there is Teddy's Red Taco success? How does she feel? What does she share with you and her feedback? Well, she she's beyond, I'm grateful as well. Yeah. And each time we, 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 we talk, Ella dice que te ve no se lo cree. Mm -hmm. You know, because like a couple of years ago, we were, you know, struggling, mm -hmm. you know, to pay the rent. We are in an apartment in East LA for like 17 years. And, you know, instead of me being supportive and helping out, I was the one asking for money. Like, hey, mom, let me borrow this. Let me borrow yeah. that. Because I was trying to build my, like say, my dream. Yeah. And to build it, you need money. You need support. You, need, you know, and even though she hated it, I, you know what, I had to be positive. Yeah. I had to be positive because I was I was looking long term. Yeah. And even though and I had, she just wanted you to get another job. She's like, yeah, this she's isn't like, hey, it. I'm just trying to pay bills. You yeah. Know? And and it, it was it was hard. Yeah. But you have to have faith. You have to have vision. Mm -hmm. You have to be excited until you know yeah that's beautiful and i'm sure she's super happy now right <laughs> she can't complain <laughs> yeah i love it so we have to get to the beloved la taco question aside from teddy's red tacos <laughs> well before, before tacos your favorite food tu favorita comida en todo el mundo me gusta mucho la pizza la pizza oh my gosh pizza's popular these weeks okay, what, pizza. with what toppings pepperoni the classic okay, ones just, and it has to be pepperoni. thin yes it has to be thin yes mm. listen i'm gonna get pizza after this y'all making me crave it <laughs> y tu favorito taco después de teddy's me gusta en la sala con tortillas a mano is there a place Guacamole. you want to shout out <laughs> i know you got I, a lot of friends you can say a couple <laughs> <laughs> hay muchos hay muchos y muchos ricos también no shade to anybody exacto yeah pero si son estilo tijuana con tortillas a mano de asada con guacamolita y todo así me gusta ok so so estilo hay muchos, tijuana yeah, estilo tijuana que tienen ¿tienes que estilo un favorito? Tijuana. hay bastantes hay ba <laughs> <laughs> so no quiero I, I don't, don't want to be you can choose a, yeah, yeah tijuana style yeah, it depends on the area si sí, ando el if I'm in LA if I'm in South Central mm. if I'm in Compton you know it's, There, there's a lot of places yes. too yeah so, but you like tijuana style mm -hmm. We love that. Well, thank you so much for being here with us, Teddy. Lara, thank you so much. I can't wait to see even more locations pop up. I'm an avid fan of East LA. When I had COVID, y'all did curbside pickup for me. Mm -hmm. We called. We were like, oh, can, if you if we if we go, can you put it in the trunk? And whoever the people were, we're like, hell yeah, we got you. <laughs> Ni lo podía probar tanto, pero la consomé hit when I needed it, okay? So mad love for you always. Thank, thank you, you for thank being you. here. We're going to take a quick break, y'all. We'll be right back. Hey, what's up? My name is Chef Carlos Jaques, and the video that I make is Estilo Los Angeles. My last four years of cooking, I spent working in downtown at ODM and Bestia, and those totally had a big influence on just like tightening up the way I organized myself in my own kitchen, which translated to my own concept. I went on a Mexico trip, spent like a month there, and I came back really excited about Mexican food. And at the time I wanted to make a little more money, and I was, I was working at Odium, and I had like a cool schedule, I had the weekends off, and I was like, okay, like, if I could just keep the schedule, ask my boss, let him know what's up, what I want to do, start selling tacos on the weekend. I wanted to be like super traditional and like reflect, like do something that like I saw growing up. I grew up in El Sereno since I was about like eight or seven years old and I experienced a lot of the sort of food and culture that this neighborhood had to offer, as well as like East LA and Boyle Heights, because those are sort of neighborhoods that had a little more of a street vending going on when I was younger. Working in these cool restaurants in downtown LA and around LA sort of like influenced uh, like the technical style and the technical approach that I have to recreating some of these things. And that's sort of where Bija Pa La Cruda like comes to light. I started at my parents' house. Uh, I was using like a small burner that I bought for like 50 bucks from one of my dad's friends in the backyard. And I was like dicing onions back there on a folding table, like for picnics on the picnic table. So we prepped there for our street stand, but then our street stand closed during the beginning of the pandemic. And then we started selling from the side of my parents' house, which lasted for like six months or something like that. And then that got like too intense. And I was like, okay, fuck this. Like we're gonna get a food truck so that I could like cook in a more safe environment uh, during the pandemic. But that was 
whack. Like the food truck was like not a fun experience. And then after that, I was looking for like restaurant kitchens. I was like, okay, like this is gonna be the move because I can't be in a food truck anymore and I don't want to go back to a street stand and I don't want to go back to this like side house kitchen. And then like all this crazy like life happened and then I find I find myself in my own studio living uh, like in City Terrace and now like it's like the optimal space to use to prep because I have like a plancha outside and I have the entire kitchen to myself and sink and like you know all my tools there and so I prep everything mostly there or at the restaurants that host us now. I think what separates Birria Pala Cruda from a lot of just the surrounding taco stands or the, the other birrerias that inspire me is that I'm sort of able to merge or like bring this like sort of get to bring this like restaurant background of execution of work and and do it at a taco stand and at a taco stand you only have you know like four or five components you have your tortilla your meat your garnishes lime onion cilantro and a salsa like you want to make them all to the best of your capability and that's what we strive to do and i think that's part of what makes us very different like i'm very focused on trying to make sure that everything that's given to our guest is like fully thought out i want everything that our guest experiences to like make them feel good and the only way we could do that is by making sure that like every that we feel good about everything we're putting on a, on the top of all the pieces have to look nice they make it it's so funny, like just onion, cilantro, meat, but like if you make this all really pretty, even on a simple taco, like you're not using tweezers to put this on a taco. Like I'm not trying to fake the funk here, like it's a taco de birria, but I'm trying to make all the components beautiful so that when you eat it, you're like, fuck yeah, this is, I feel beautiful now because I'm eating it. My goals and like, I guess I'm ultimately call this dreams for Vida para la Cruda have changed a little bit over the last few years, but ultimately now I really want to be able to give back to the community and open a brick and mortar restaurant to like provide stable employment for people that are looking for that in their life. Like I couldn't have made Vida para la Cruda popular without the community coming by. And I want to give back by sharing the popularity with the community, you know what I mean? And letting other people be a part of this. It almost has like four eggs on it, five eggs on it. So people open it up and like, this is a huge sandwich. My name is Aaron Melendres, co-owner and chef of Uptown Provisions. Some of the things that we're known for right now is our egg salad sandwich. Uh, I took in influence, I guess, from like a Japanese egg salad sandwich to the egg salad that you used to eat when you were a kid found the fine balance and made something that was truly ours. I'm pretty proud of it because it comes on a really nice brioche bread. All the bread here gets buttered, toasted, that's mando. Uh, we always believe in having nice crispy bread. A little spicy Japanese mayo right here. So it's soft, it has like this like subtle Japanese influence to it. Uh, if, if it hits the bun, there's a lot of thought and detail that goes into everything. Like everything else here, you get the pickled red onions. We still got beautiful. Heirloom tomatoes too. Okay, so we got a big lettuce stack right here. It's super enjoyable and very filling. Uh, if you look at it, it almost has like four eggs on it, five eggs on it. So people open it up and like, this is a huge sandwich, but that's what we are at the Town Provisions. Uh, we want to, uh, you know, provide a, a value to our guests. So every time you open a sandwich, you're gonna see this might be two meals. One thing that you can always bet on here is our pastrami sandwich. We use the same pastrami as we use at Langer's and uh, some of the other uh, big pastrami houses in LA. So that one is on uh, Hey Brother Baker uh, Alpine rye bread. So it's actually a beautifully balanced rye bread. Some people sometimes can be turned off by rye bread. It's like a little too sharp for them, but I think our rye bread kind of has this you know, sourdough to it um, and the rye is very aromatic in it. So it's a perfect complement to the pastrami. I mean, who doesn't like a buttery ass rye bread? <laughs> That's even like old school like diner shit though. We cut the sandwich that way, so I run my toppings that way. The pastrami is a navel cut brisket pastrami, so it has that perfect balance of lean and fat to it. So when you're eating it, it's just not dry. It has the perfect balance. So this is a, this is the key right here. A blend of lean and fat, uh, even on the sandwich. This is already a good cut, but even my staff makes it, they know to blend the two well. So look for the perfect bite. One slice. Two slices of Swiss. 
oven. The toaster will melt that Swiss down. On that, we do a little bit of a sour, like some fresh sauerkraut. Our sauce that we call 999 sauce, which is like a really spicy uh, Thousand Island dressing. So Uptown Provisions is located at 12819 Penn Street. We, we're in Uptown Whittier, but we're just off of Greenleaf. You can find us on Instagram at, at Uptown Provisions. You can find us on Facebook. You can find me here every day. Welcome back, everybody. Today's episode has just been like chicken soup for my soul because I've been able to touch on so many of my favorite things in life. And now we are here to welcome LA taco legend, Eric Huerta from Orale Boa Heights podcast to talk about another one of my favorite things in this world, swap meets. Yes, thank swap you for having meets. me. Yo, Eric, bienvenido. It's super exciting to be next to you always. I feel like you're all knowing. You've been in the LA taco team since its inception or near its inception, right? Since uh, 2007, I've been contributing. 2007, a contributor since then. And LA taco started in 2005. Yep. To, listen, you've seen <laughs> LA taco through all of the growth and the beauty and all of the amazing things that it is now. To start off, I just want you to take the time to introduce yourself. Who are you? What do you do? What have you done for LA taco? ¿Quién eres en la comunidad? So, <laughs> I, to answer all those questions at once, I'm a fucking metiche. <laughs> <laughs> we love it. Listen, I, I, I say that proudly, too. <laughs> yeah, it's um, I I say that in jest, right? It, but that that is honestly how I got on the track that I am now. Mm -hmm. You know, having a background in journalism, shout out to East LA Community College. You, like, what up? you know, that's where I learned to trade and got my foundation. And then from those skills, I just took it upon myself to start, you know, writing and doing things out there for the community and reporting and, and being being a teacher, being nosy. And that's part of like the life of being a reporter. So it, it's, you know, it's what's pushed me forward. Obviously, yeah, you know, as you get older, we mature, we go through life, we experience things. I've, mm -hmm. I've learned to be a better metiche mm -hmm. right you know knowing when to keep a secret and when not to keep a secret mm. and balancing all of that out but for the better part it's just been you know it's been a journey like anybody else and it, it, it is a, a trip to reflect on it now right because la taco has had so many people come through through the doors in different stages of the of the website to the blog of the the, the media you know entity that it is today yes. and it, it speaks volumes that la taco is who, what it is now because of the people who have come through and who are still here today like you contributing yeah, and, and doing all this too, work yo, yeah. how many pieces have you written for Ali Taco at this point? <laughs> not that many No, well, I mean, you, the ones that you have are super important <laughs> it's, it's only been when you know I, I'm like alright cool I feel the energy let me go do this I can write this out boom and, not, and it's usually because I have a free weekend to like knock mm. it out before I have to think about my day job the rest of the week yeah get into that what do you do in your day job so I am the media organizer for East Yard Communities for Environmental Justice you can find us on online at East Yard, you know, Instagram, Twitter, everywhere. And yeah, my role there is just to support the amazing work that everybody else does. The organizers, you know, our two co-directors, everybody that's part of the membership is always holding it down, always fighting. LA Taco just had this piece, right, about mm -hmm. um, Vernon, you know, with all this yeah. contamination going on. And organizations like East Yard have been holding around, holding it down for years and you know these are the folks that we need fighting for us at these agency meetings at this public comment meetings at these spaces where we can't be there because we're at work we're at right. school we have other responsibilities but they're the ones you know yelling at all these politicians all these elected officials all these people that are responsible for our health and safety mm. to do their, their basic right. job right and to protect keep us, us safe yeah yeah you know because otherwise we'll end up with like another 30-year you know exide poisoning the community that's so fucked up. It's beautiful to hear that. I feel like your work connects and intersects in that way, right? Like, I think a lot of the people that are contributing to LA Taco do so and you see the passion in the writing because we're connected to it in other ways aside from just wanting to be a metiche and tell, talk about it. No, it, it's it's our lives. You yeah. know, it's our neighborhood. It's our, it's our yep. culture. It's, it's our we're traditions. We're telling our stories. And for so many years, that was not the, the, the thing to do. Yeah. Right? With, with me and my path to journalism, I eventually got fed up with it because I didn't want to be unbiased. I didn't want to have the traditional path of you're supposed to be, you know, talking to both sides of the coin. You can't use your lived experience because it's not valid in reporting and all these other things. I was like, fuck that. Yeah. You know, I'm, I live in the neighborhood where I live in Bull Heights. I'm an how expert do you, at it. How do you disconnect it. from that? Yeah. I, it's easy. I just say, fuck that. No, no, no. I mean, like, how do, how do folks ask you to disconnect from that is what I meant. <laughs> 
yeah, it varies. Like it's easy, just fuck that. Yeah, it's like everybody, yeah. you know, tries to, to come in with their own rules and set yeah. of guidelines and and their way of structuring things. But you really have to stand on your own. You really have to hold it down. You really yeah. have to like push and advocate for yourself and be yeah. like, no, my lived experience is worth it. You know, it brings I, more to it, the story. It if anything, adds so much more to it. And mm-hmm. then on top of that, you have access to people around you who know you from the community. Know you are like doing something that is for it and not extractive mm-hmm. so they'll be more willing to talk to you more willing to support you more willing to connect you with other people as yeah. well i love that thank you for breaking that down for us one piece that you wrote actually in december around the time that a lot of us do gift giving was a piece about swap meats yeah swap meat life the fact that they're slowly going away they're slowly yeah. breaking like you know they're they're, yeah. they're becoming non-existent which i hope not i hope not listen my family that the Heda lineage has connections and generations in swap meets. I just have to, I can't have this conversation with you and I'm low-key getting emotional <laughs> without naming Marta Tejeda, mm. who was an OG swap meet. I had to text my dad last night and be like, dad, which swap meet did she vend at? Because my grandma had me at all of them. And she was also, no, Senor, senora, senor, senor Tejeda. She was a badass bitch. She wasn't a bitch. She was a badass. Okay, sorry. Yo. It was a term of endearment. I, 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 grandma. <laughs> no, grandma. But, we used to call her grandma. But shout out to all those folks, right? Especially those who we we had to be there for a lot of different reasons. And we had to work it, right? Yeah. And, you know, in, in, in our young age, in our, in our teenage age, and a little bit older in life, it's a family business, it right? Is, and even yeah. if you go to any Swami today, you'll still see the kids of the, the parents. And just know? like probably upset, but not recognizing like the hustle that we're <laughs> that we're witnessing. So I actually never sold. She would just take me to kind of like, I guess, check on shit. Because that's really what it felt. It felt like I was walking around with the godfather yeah. or godmother of Swap Meets. Because everybody knew her. She'd pick a couple of things that wouldn't even pay for it and like make a sign gesture. And it was like, Señora Tejada, si la conocemos. But my dad told me that he would go sometimes and he hated it. And my dad is the most fiscally responsible person. Mm-hmm. My my credit score is excellent, thanks to the, the and, and fuck credit scores, right? But I was like, but low key, I'm kind of proud. But like everything, I'm like all of those things connect to like the the lessons we learn in watching yeah. if we're a part of that, yeah. right? So we don't make those connections as kids. But let's get into your piece. What did you write about? Let's talk about swap meets. What do swap meets mean to you to begin with? To me, swap meets as an adult now where i am in life and can reflect on this right you know appreciating growing up in them and the different aspects of it from visiting to working behind the scenes Mm -hmm. i see swap meets as cultural spaces that provide resources to the communities they're in and sometimes are vital in being that cultural space where folks can go on a saturday especially on a sunday right you take the family you go get something to eat you buy socks you buy sandals you buy something that you needed you go catch a live band you go to the swamis like the alameda swamis where they have clowns where they have <laughs> kitty rides with horses yeah you know you spend the whole afternoon usually after church mm-hmm. uh, at the swami doing a little bit of everything and then you get home and you feel re- recharged and you're ready to take on the week and do it all over again yes i love that i think that when i used to go it was exciting because they'd give me like a dollar 25 when i'd go with my mom to the vi- vi- vinland Violent, I don't know what. Violent, my, yeah. violent. And it was like I would make that 125 a last. Listen, I would haggle. Okay, <laughs> there's not much I had, but it would be like, oh yeah, that little little umbrella cocktail umbrellas, 25 cents. I'd be like, how about 10? Yeah. You know, like yeah. that shit. You learn so many skills at the swap meets. Which are some of your favorites? To me, these days is a as where I am in this stage in life. As I've been reflecting on this, right? I figured out that. You know, back then, I used to go to the Swami all the time with my family. Mm -hmm. You know, public transportation, driving, whatever. We used to go hit hit up all the good ones. But back then, I started realizing that we didn't have the money, you know, to buy anything we wanted, right? We we would go there with a purpose. Or sometimes even just to walk around because we needed to kill an afternoon. You know, just window shop. And that's a good way to spend the, the day. But now as an adult with a job and with disposable income because <laughs> I don't have pets or kids or any of these so other responsibilities. Yeah. yeah, I'm like, oh, I can buy that <laughs> and not even think twice about it. The only thing I have to think twice about is if I have enough cash in my wallet. Yep, or it's cash only, baby. Can I talk to the vendor and be like, do you have Venmo? Yeah. Right? You know, Zell. do you have another form of payment? And I'll be like, let me hook you up. Mm-hmm. So I, I've been taking advantage of it and I've been slowly becoming camera corrector right just oh. finding old film cameras that's so dope yeah. I was, my next question was going to be what's your what's been your most famous find from swap meets my <laughs> nazi per, any- nazi paraphernalia <laughs> <laughs> what <laughs> yeah get into that why so the rule of thumb <laughs> for anybody going to not the swan not like a hood swami but like a flea market mm-hmm. right 
is if you see racist uh you know items paraphernalia that's out there right in the open and casual you find a really good spot you're gonna find a lot of gems because mm. that's that's the kind of stuff that if if somebody felt so comfortable they can just have a nazi flag and german like world war ii medals out there or even like the really like messed up visual stuff where it's like character caricatures of black people and, and blackface right if they feel that comfortable selling that kind of stuff you know other people are going to be selling really good stuff and it never fails like that day that i came across a nazi flag i found a camera for 10 bucks wow yeah. oh so the nazi paraphernalia it just guides you to the place where they'll have good things yeah you don't collect that no oh, I, that's, I thought that's what you were saying i was like eric is this conversation gonna go a different way <laughs> so that to you is uh it it's shows you it's a sign that yeah. shows you you're about to find some good shit oh my god and that was at Listen. the torrens torrens flea market okay that's really cool i was like you made me a little nervous i'm sweating a little bit <laughs> Let's talk about if, if you look closely look at it closely when you go to the rose bowl you'll find racist stuff yeah and it's all of it, it are goods that were sold through folks. What is, what is it called when people pass away and they have their heritage? I don't want to call it it's just like their cultural things that they had. It's their, um, in the estates. That's estate what I meant. Like estate sales. sales, right? Like people's homes. To, I know there's still people alive who have some fucked up ass shit they in do. their homes, and then yeah. that's sold at estate sales, and then that's somehow taken to like swap meets and flea markets. Well, I mean, like you know, right through television and through so many other things, and obviously through the internet and eBay right collecting antiques is taking on another life of its own mm -hmm. and in in many ways right like physically having to go somewhere to buy something is kind of like getting getting outdated in so yeah. many ways right because the convenience of being at home and just looking it up and finding it and just hitting a button right but to me that's also part of the fun is just going out there you know slowly walking by looking left right left yeah. right like maybe spotting something and going in the through corner. every aisle is so important touching everything yes <laughs> asking prices right. yeah it's all part of the process exactly unless you go to find something specific because one time i was trying to go just bobear like me and my family say and they were pissed as fuck at me because they were like we came for one car part and you out here just trying to shop and i'm like yeah how are you gonna come to the swap meet and not go through every aisle that's what you do it's disrespectful it's if you, you ask me I, I was gonna say like one of my recommendations is don't along with the with the nazi stuff yeah. if you see that <laughs> another good rule of thumb is don't ever go there uh with a with a schedule right yeah. with like you have to be somewhere at two nah forget yeah, that you're gonna be gonna there happen. all day yeah, yeah it's not gonna happen you get too excited you do i do <laughs> i mean like i the thing i was talking to with the homie about was it, it, i trip out because i was like i'm at the swap meet at this swap meet on this particular day and i found this particular item mm -hmm. at this particular time of the day and i was like this is a message that i should buy this yeah, because I don't it know if it's something. gonna be there. Yeah, yeah. You don't, and you don't know if you're gonna ever find it again because that's like the mystery and <sighs> beauty of swap meets too. Yeah, even I, special furniture pieces yeah. or like shoes. I, I mean, would. I love vintage clothing, and sometimes people go to these bougie ass vintage stores. You go to the swap meet, you find a pair of shoes from an old girl's house that she had when she was sixteen for way cheaper, yep. listen, a dollar. Yep. I got, you got, I got it. I the shoes I'm wearing it. right now, I got it at the swap meet. You better work. What kind of this? Let me take that's it. That's it. We got, we got to see. <laughs> it's a slip on. <laughs> it's a bad. Leopards. Okay. Twenty bucks. Twenty dollars. No, Would you always no, find? No smell. Okay, you no better work. Nothing. I was I was low key staying a little <laughs> far away. I didn't want to smell. <laughs> but you'll always have a good find at a swamp meet. Oh I my feel God. like whether it's a snack, whether it's something that you didn't think you'd find, oh, there's always. <laughs> We'll put the shoe back on um, <laughs> once the episode is done. But let's get into, um, did you know the history of swap meets? Kind of, a little bit. I had to look into it a little uh, bit kinda, too. But please share, you have it. I just, I didn't even write the family's name down, but I do know, I'm going to share a bias that I had. I thought swap, first of all, when I was a kid, I would call them swamp meets. Mm. So somehow I thought there was a connection between swamps and the meat. Like the bayou. Uh, my brain did that. The bayou, right? I was like, they must be connected. Um, but I just found out that they mostly started with the vending of like dairy items. And I forgot the name of the family. I thought I wrote the note down, but the Paramount swap meet specifically, I'm not sure about the history mm -hmm, of the other ones, mm -hmm. started off um, at a place where like folks can sell the 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 dairy products right, right? Yeah. like the milk the eggs and all of that and then from there that's when folks started inviting like artisanal like creatives and artists i i thought the history was always just people of color coming together to just mention <laughs> so for me it means that and i feel like we've made it evolved right evolve it's, into yeah. that every community makes it their own and mm -hmm. and then that like the history of it is so enthralling to me mm -hmm. because it really you know coming at it from like anthropology perspective it's really cool to see how communities come together 
and feel a need that they need right mm-hmm. it, it's not too strange to think that somebody back then in the 1800s 1700s got the idea it's like hey all we all got used stuff for sale we should just come together one day and sell yeah. it to each other or even like the the systems that are more becoming more formalized now with like bartering with people mm-hmm. right like hey i cook you something you come fix my house or yeah. you, you do this or i do that for you so for me especially like with the paramount i was reading that that though a lot of the, the swamis that we know today came about out of convenience right so mm-hmm. paramount and a couple of other theaters used to be drive-in theaters mm-hmm. and they still are sometimes during the week so the days that they're not you know showing movies the owners were realizing like what do we need what, what do we, we do, do with, with the this land? extra space yeah. yeah let's just tell people come in here sell your junk mm-hmm. and then it just continued like paramount has been doing it for like more than 30 years well since the 50s i read yeah. but, i mean obviously its inception was for dairy farmers and all that but. so you know things evolved over time but yeah. you know the one of the swamis that closed down not too long ago last year was um los amigos off jefferson in mm-hmm. south central that one was around for 30 years yeah you know i just hope they stay alive yo i love swamis meats. i'm yeah. here for them but thank you so much for joining us i didn't ask you your favorite taco but on a fire spot question right now what's your favorite taco in los angeles right now tacos arabes tacos arabes Shout out to them on Olympic. And Olympic. Yes. You got to check them out if you haven't tried them, y'all. Eric, thank you for joining us. Thank you. For all folks watching, we did want to let you know that our episodes are now live on Apple and Spotify as podcasts. Hey. So you could tune in to LA Taco Live and you could catch all the episodes we've had as a podcast. And I did want to close out by saying that we just want to give a huge thank you and so much love to the folks here at Mod Pod Studios in Pasadena. They have been so gracious, y'all. We have gone through 13 episodes with them. We've grown so much. I've learned so much and this is actually going to be our last episode here today in Pasadena we're transitioning to a new space listen we're bringing you more after a quick spring break okay so we're going to take a couple weeks off stay tuned on the Instagram to make sure when we're back but we're excited to bring you a new space a lot more great episodes new content it's about to be fire thanks for tuning in y'all we'll see you very very soon hey woo woo woo